Pinder the Complete Odes Translated by Anthony Verity The Complete Odes Olympians Olympian 1 For Hieron of Syracuse, winner of the single horse race water is best, while gold gleams like blazing fire in the night, brightest amid a rich man's wealth, but, my heart, if it is of games that you wish to sing, look no further than the sun, as there is no star that shines with more warmth by day from a clear sky, so we can speak of no greater contest than Olympia. From here come fame giving hymns, which wrap themselves around the minds of poets who have come to the rich and blessed hearth of Hieron to sing aloud of the son of Cronus. Hieron holds the scepter of justice in sheep-rich Sicily, where he chooses for himself the finest fruits of every kind of excellence. His glory gleams in the best of poetry and music, of the kind that we men often compose and play at his hospitable table. Come then, take down the Dorian lyre from its peg, if the splendor of Olympian Pisa and of Ferenicus has caused the sweetest thoughts to steal into your mind, as it sped along unwhipped in the race beside Alpheus. And brought its master into victory's embrace, Hieron, Syracuse's horse-delighting king. His fame shines out over the land of fine men founded by Lydian Pelops, he whom Poseidon the mighty earth-holder desired after Clotho had lifted him from the purifying cauldron, fitted with a shoulder of gleaming ivory. There are indeed many wonders, and it may be that in men's talk stories are embroidered beyond the truth, and so deceive us with their elaborate lies, since the beguiling charm of words, the source of all sweet pleasures for men, adds luster and veracity to the unbelievable. The days to come will be the wisest judge of that, but it is proper that a man should speak well of the gods, thus he is less likely to incur blame. Son of Tantalus, the tale I shall tell about you runs counter to that told by former poets. When your father invited the gods to that well-ordered banquet in his beloved Sipolis, reciprocating the hospitality he had enjoyed, then it was that the god of the glorious trident, his heart overpowered by desire seized you and carried you off in a golden chariot to the lofty palace of widely honored Zeus, where in later time Ganymede also came to perform the same service, but for Zeus. When you had disappeared from sight, and, despite their frequent searches, no one could bring you back to your mother, immediately an ill-intentioned neighbor secretly spread the tale abroad that the guests had taken a knife and dismembered you, and had thrown your limbs into water as it boiled fiercely over the fire, and then at table, during the final course, they shared out your flesh and ate it. As for me, I cannot call any of the blessed gods a cannibal. I stand aside, the slanderous seldom win themselves profit. If ever the watchers on Olympus gave a mortal honor, that man indeed was Tantalus. But no good came of it, for he could not digest his great prosperity, and by his excesses brought overwhelming ruin on himself, the father poised a huge stone above him. And in his constant struggle to thrust it from his head he now wanders far from happiness. This is the life of everlasting weariness he lives, one labor following after another, because for his feast he stole from the gods the nectar and ambrosia they gave to make him immortal and served it to his drinking companions. If a man hopes his deeds will escape the gods' notice he is mistaken. So the immortal sent his son back to him, to be immortal again in the short-lived company of men. And about the time of his handsome youthful bloom, when downy hair began to cover his darkening jaw, he turned his thoughts to an offer of marriage that was offered to all, to win at Pisa the famous Hippodamia from her father Enomaus. Alone, at night, he went down to the grey sea's shore and called out to the deep-roaring lord of the trident, and the god was there, close by him. Pelops said to him, If the delightful gifts of Cyprus can give rise to gratitude, then come, shackle the bronze spear of Enomaus, send me on the swiftest of chariots to Elis, and bring me the power to be victorious. Thirteen suitors has Enomaus killed, and in this way delays the marriage of his daughter. Cowards do not seek out great risks, men must die, so why should anyone crouch in darkness, aimlessly nursing an undistinguished old age, without a share in glorious deeds? This contest is meant for me, now give me the success desire. So he spoke, and his pleas were not in vain. The god gave him honor, and a golden chariot with tireless winged horses. So he defeated Enomaus and won the maiden to share his bed, and fathered six sons, leaders of the people, all of them thirsting to do great deeds. And now he luxuriates in splendid blood offerings as he reclines beside the fort of Alpheus. His tomb beside his altar is well tended, thronged about by many a stranger. 
The fame which stems from Pelops games at Olympia is visible from afar, the games where the contest is for fleetness of foot and daring deeds of strength pushed to the limit. For the rest of his days the victor enjoys honey-sweet tranquility, as far, that is, as the games can provide it, the highest good for every mortal is indeed that which comes to him day by day. My task is to crown such a man as this with the horseman's song, in Aeolian melody. I am certain that there is no host today more acquainted with glorious deeds or more established in his power, whom my craft can adorn with fame-giving intricacies of song. Some god, Hieron, watches over your ambitions, making this his concern. If he does not desert you I hope to find an even more inviting path of poetry to help me celebrate your victory in the swift chariot, when I visit the sunlit hill of Cronus. For me, the muse keeps a mighty defensive weapon. Other men attain greatness in different ways, the highest peaks are occupied by kings, so do not look to climb further. May you walk on high in this reign of yours, and may I always be the victor's companion, preeminent by my poetry throughout all Hellas. Olympian II. For Theron of Acragas, winner of the chariot race my hymns, commanders of the lyre, which god, which hero, which man shall we celebrate? Zeus is indeed lord of Pisa, and Heracles founded the Olympic Games as the first fruits of war, but the man we must proclaim is Theron, for his victory with the four-horse chariot. He is just in his regard for strangers, a strong tower of defense for Acragas, the crowning glory of a famous family line, a man who guides his city on a straight path. His forebears labored hard in their hearts and so won a holy habitation beside the river. They were the envy of Sicily, and as time sped them on its destined road it added wealth and popular favor to crown their inborn talents. Son of Cronus and Rhea, you who rule over your home on Olympus, and over this greatest of games and Alpheus stream, be warmed by my songs, and in your kindness preserve their native land for generations to come. But when some deed has been done, right or wrong, not even time the father of all things can undo its outcome, yet with the help of good fortune men may forget it. Grief dies when confronted by noble joys, and its enduring bitterness is beaten down when fortune sent from a god lifts a man to prosperity's heights. This saying fits the royal throne daughters of Cadmus, whose sufferings were great, yet even so, heavy sorrow sinks back in the face of mightier blessings. Long-haired Semele died amid the roar of thunder, but she lives on among the Olympian gods, loved for all time by Pallas and Father Zeus, and especially loved by her ivy-wearing son. Eno too, men say, was granted an immortal's life for all time in the depths, along with Nereus' sea nymph daughters. But for mortals death's final point has not been fixed, nor even when we shall peacefully conclude our day, child of the sun, in lasting good fortune. Streams of pleasure and pain flood over men at different times, and so it is that fate, which controls the benevolent destiny that this family has enjoyed, can bring some suffering even into their heaven-sent prosperity, which in time to come may be reversed, from the time when Laius' son met his father and, as had been foretold, killed him, so fulfilling the oracle delivered long before at Pytho. The sharp-eyed fury saw this act, and slew his warlike sons, who died at each other's hands. When Polynices fell he left behind his son Thersandrus, who won honor both in young men's contests and in the battles of war, a young shoot from Adrastus' stock, destined to be an avenger of his house. It is fitting that the son of Enesidemus, whose roots are traced back to that seed, should enjoy the praise of songs and of the lyre, for at Olympia he received the prize himself. While at Pytho and the Isthmus the Graces who favor both awarded the crown in the twelve-lap four-horse chariot race equally to his brother. For a man who competes in the game's victory brings relief from dark thoughts. Truly wealth, adorned with many noble qualities, offers a man the chance to achieve all manner of things and prompts in him a desire for high ambition, which is a far shining star, the surest light there is for men. If a man possesses wealth and knows the future, that the defenseless spirits of those who die here are quickly punished, and that for crimes committed here in Zeus' kingdom there is a judge below the earth who declares sentence of harsh necessity. But for good men the nights and sunny days are in perpetual equal balance, they enjoy a life with less toil, not troubling the earth or seize waters with their hand strength in order to produce a meager livelihood. Those who in life took pleasure in keeping oaths passed their time without tears in the company of the revered gods, while the wicked endure a punishment too dreadful to behold. But 
those with the courage to have lived three times in either place, keeping their hearts entirely free from wrongdoing, travel the road of Zeus to the Tower of Cronus, where breezes of ocean blow round the island of the blessed. Their flowers of gold shine like flame, some on bright trees on the land, some nourished by the sea, with these they weave bracelets for their arms and crowns for their heads, according to the equitable judgments of Radamanthes, whom at all times the great father, husband of Rhea, she who occupies the highest throne, seats beside himself. Peleus and Cadmus are counted among their company, and Achilles, brought there by his mother when by her prayers she had won over the heart of Zeus. Achilles it was who felled Hector, Troy's indomitable mighty pillar, and who brought sickness to death, and the Ethiopian, son of the dawn. I have many swift arrows in the quiver under my arm. They speak to those who understand, but for the most part they require interpreters. Wise is the man who knows much by nature, while those who have acquired their knowledge chatter in pointless confusion, just like a pair of crows against the divine bird of Zeus. Come, my heart, aim your bow at the mark. Who are we now to strike, as we shoot fame's arrows with gentle intent? I bend my bow at Akragas, proclaiming on oath and with true understanding that no city in a hundred years has given birth to a man more generous in spirit to his friends or more open-handed than Theron. But praise can soon turn out to be excessive if it is not attended by impartiality, but comes from the mouths of the disaffected, who seek with idle chatter to obscure good men's noble deeds. As surely as grains of sand are beyond counting, who could say how many acts of kindness this man has performed for other men? Olympian 3. For Theron of Acragas, winner of the chariot race to please the hospitable sons of Tyndareus and Helen of the beautiful hair, and to honor famous Acragas is my prayer as I begin a hymn to Theron for his Olympic victory, this is the finest reward for horses with never-wearying hoofs. This is why, I believe, the muse stood beside me as I composed in a brilliant new way to fit my voice of glorious celebration to the Dorian measure, since the victory reads woven in his hair exact payment from me of this God-inspired debt, to combine and do harmony the many-voiced lyre, the cry of pipes, and the placement of words in honor of Enesidima's son. Pisa too instructs me to speak out, for from there come God-given songs to men, whenever the unswerving Hellene judge, an alien of Aetolian stock. Fulfilling Heracles' ancient orders, sets above a man's brow the glory of the grey-green olive in his hair, which once Amphitryon's son brought from Istra's shadowed springs to be the supreme memorial of contests, at Olympia. Her Heracles had by his eloquence won over the Hyperborean people, Apollo's servants. With honorable intent he begged from them for the all-welcoming grove of Zeus a tree to furnish shade for all, and to be a crown for deeds of prowess. For by now altars had been dedicated to his father, and the gold chariot moon at mid-month evening had shown her eye full upon him. He had laid down the great game's holy principle of judgment, and had established the four-year cycle for his festival, to be held beside the sacred banks of Alpheus, but the land of Pelops grew no lovely trees in the dales of the son of Cronus. Without their protection this enclosure seemed to him to be at the mercy of the sun's burning rays. It was then his spirit moved him to go to the land of Istrus. Their Leda's daughter, driver of horses, had welcomed him from Arcadia's mountain ridges and its secret twisting places, when in obedience to Eurystheus. Commands and under duress from his father, he was ordered to capture the doe with golden horns, which once the nymph Teigida had dedicated to be a sacred offering to Orthosia. In his pursuit of her he came to see the land that lies beyond the blasts of the icy north wind. There he stood and marveled at the trees, and a sweet desire seized him to plant some around the point in the twelve-lap course where horses turn. And so today he gladly attends this his festival with the godlike twins, sons of deep-girdled Leto. Departing for Olympus he instructed them to take charge of the admired games, where men compete in prowess and swift chariots are driven. And so, I believe, my spirit urges me to tell Theron and the amenity that glory has come to them through the gift of the sons of Tyndareus, expert horsemen, because of all mortals they honor them with the most numerous hospitable feasts, preserving by their pious intention the rights of the blessed gods. If water is best, and gold the most revered of all possessions, now Theron in his turn, by his deeds of merit, has traveled from his home to the world's limits and lays hold of the pillars of Heracles. Further than this neither simpletons nor wise should go. I shall not venture there, 
I should be a fool to try. Olympian 4. For Samus of Camarina, winner of the chariot race? Supreme charioteer of the tireless footed thunder, Zeus, you I invoke, because your seasons, circling to the sound of the many voiced lyre, have sent me to be a witness at the greatest games. When friends achieve success, men forth with feel joy at the welcome news. Come, son of Cronus, you who reign over Etna, windswept cap of powerful hundred headed Typhos prison, receive this Olympic victor and, to please the graces, welcome this reveling procession, a longest shining light on noble deeds of mighty strength. It comes in honor of the chariot of Samus, who is crowned at Pisa with a garland of olive, and makes haste to bring glory to Camarina. May the god listen kindly to his prayers in time to come, for I praise him as a diligent rearer of horses, a man who delights in offering hospitality to all, and whose candid manner inclines him towards concord, the friend of cities. I shall not stain my tale with a lie, the true test of men is endurance to the end. This it was that saved the son of Clymenus from losing face among the women of Lemnos. He had won the race in bronze armor, and going up to Hypsipyle to receive his crown, said, You have seen my speed, my hands and heart are equally strong. Often even young men produce gray hairs before the time they are expected to appear. Olympian 5. For Samus of Camarina, winner of the mule race Camarina, daughter of Oceanus, accept with a joyful heart this sweet offering a supreme reward for high deeds of prowess and crowns won at Olympia, a gift of Samus and his tireless-footed mules. He has glorified your city, nurse of people, and has honored the six double altars at the gods' greatest festival with ox sacrifices and, in the strenuous five-day games, with races of chariots, mules, and the single horse. Victorious, he has made you an offering of lavish glory, spreading abroad the fame of his father Akron and of his newly founded city. O Pallas, protector of cities, he has come from the beautiful dwellings of Pelops and Enemaus, and he sings in praise of your sacred grove and Oanos your river, and its neighboring lake, and the holy channels through which the hip Paris brings water to your people. Swiftly he constructs a lofty grove of well-built houses, and leads your townspeople here from despair into the light. Always, when men strive for excellence, toil and expense struggle towards an accomplishment in which risk lies concealed. But the successful are judged to be wise, even by their fellow citizens. O Savior Zeus, high above us in the clouds, inhabitant of the hill of Cronus, you who honor broad flowing Alpheus and Ida's holy cave, to you I come as suppliant, accompanied by Lydian pipes, to beg you to adorn this city with a noble race of men, and to ask that you, Olympic victor, delighting in the horses of Poseidon, may bring your old age to a serene end with your sons, Samus, by your side. If a man waters a healthy prosperity and is content with a sufficiency of possessions and adds to this good repute, he should not strive to become a god. Olympian 6. For Hegesias of Syracuse, winner of the mule race golden, are the pillars we shall set beneath the chamber's well-made porch, as if we were building a marvelous palace. When a work is begun its outward face must be made to gleam afar, and if a man should be victorious at Olympia, and is a steward of the prophetic altar of Zeus at Pisa, and moreover a joint founder of famous Syracuse, how could such a man escape a celebratorium, if he chances to live among townsmen who do not stint their tribute of pleasing songs? Let Sostratus' son know that this is the sandal to which the heavenly powers have fitted his foot. Success without labor is not honored among men, either on land or in hollow ships, but if noble deeds are accomplished through toil many people remember them. Men are ready to praise you, Hegesias, as once Adrastus justly spoke out in praise of Amphiaros, son of Echols, when the earth swallowed him and his shining horses. Later, when the corpses had been burnt on their seven pyres, Talos' son spoke in Thebes as follows, I grieve for the loss of my armies I, a man skilled as a seer and also as a spearfighter. This too can be said of the Syracusan master of this revel. I am not disputatious nor overeager for victory but I will swear a great oath and testify that this is true, and the sweet-voiced muses will bear me out. Come, Phintus, quickly yoke me the strong mules, that I may drive my chariot on an open road and arrive at this family's true origin. These mules, more than others, know how to take the lead on this road, for they have won crowns at Olympia. We must therefore throw wide the gates of song for them and come today in good time to Pitane, beside the waters of Eurotas. 
She it was, men say, who coupled with Cronus' son Poseidon and bore a daughter, Ewan of the violet-colored hair. She concealed the fruit of her unwed labor by the folds of her dress, and in her birth month dispatched her maids to Epitus, the hero son of Iletus, with orders to deliver the child into his keeping. He was king of the Arcadians of Phasane, and had his allotted home beside the Alpheus. Here Ewan was raised, and here she gave herself to Apollo and first tasted the delights of Aphrodite. But she could not hide the god's seed from Epitus forever, with painful self-control he thrust down in his heart the anger he could not speak of, and went to Pytho to consult the oracle concerning his intolerable grief. Meanwhile she had laid aside her purple belt and silver jug, and in a dark copse began the birth of a son with the spirit of a god. To help her, the golden-haired god sent the fates and Elythia, giver of gentle counsel. Without delay, in joyful birth pangs Iamus issued from her womb into the light. In her distress she left him there on the ground, but by the god's designs two grey-eyed snakes nurtured him, feeding him on the blameless venom of bees. When the king had driven back from rocky Pytho he questioned everyone in the house about the boy Ewan had born, because, he said, his father was Phoebus, and he would surpass all mortals as a seer for mankind and his posterity would never fail. This much he revealed, but they claimed that though the boy was five days old they had neither seen nor heard of him. And in truth he had been hidden on a bed of rushes under a great bush, his tender body suffused with the gold and purple radiance of violets. And this is why his mother had declared that for all time he would be known by this immortal name. When in time he plucked the fruit of lovely gold-crowned youth, he waded midstream into the Alpheus and called on Poseidon the wide ruler, his grandfather, and on the Bauhandler, guardian of God-built Delos. Under the open night sky he asked for himself an office in which he could minister to his people. Clear came his father's voice in answer, saying, Arise, my son, and accompany my voice to a land which everyone may share. So they came to the steep rock of lofty Cronus' son, and there he gave him a double treasure of prophecy, first, to hear the voice that could not lie, and later, after the coming of bold Heracles, a revered shoot from the stock of the Alcidae, and his institution of a festival, thronged by men, for his father, the great foundation of the games, he told him to set up an oracle at the very top of Zeus' altar. From that time the Iamid clan has been renowned in Hellas. Prosperity has followed them, they honor noble deeds and walk on a road where all can see them. Their every action bears witness to this, while the carping of other, rancorous men hangs over those on whom, as they lead the race in the final lap of twelve, revered grace has shed a brilliant beauty. If, Hegesias, your maternal ancestors, living beneath the mountain of Selene, did in truth piously offer abundant prayers and sacrifices to Hermes, herald of the gods, whose charge it is to watch over the games and the contest's outcome, and who holds Arcadia in honor, land of brave men, then, son of Sostratus, it is he who with his deep thundering father has brought about your good fortune. On my tongue I feel a sharp whetstone, willingly, I am drawn on by lovely breaths of song. My mother's mother was Stymphalian Medope, fair as a flower, who bore Thebe, driver of horses, from whose enchanting spring I shall drink, while I weave an intricate song for spear warriors. Now, Aeneas, exhort your companions first to proclaim Hera Parthenia, and then to see if my truthful words can deflect that ancient jibe, Boeotian pig, for you are an upright envoy. A message stick of the fair-haired muses, a sweet mixing bowl of loud echoing songs. Tell them to remember Syracuse and Ortigia, where Hieron rules with untainted scepter and straight counsels, honoring crimson-footed Demeter and keeping the festival of her daughter of the white horses, and the feast of mighty Zeus on Etna. Hieron is known to sweet-voiced lyres and songs, may passing time not shatter his prosperity, but may he with gracious affection welcome Hegesia's revel as it returns, home from home, leaving Stymphalus walls, mother city of Arcadia rich in flocks. On a stormy night it is wise to drop two anchors from a swift ship. May some friendly god grant a glorious destiny to both. Lord, master of the sea, husband of Amphitrite of the gold spindle, grant them a straight passage, free from trouble, and swell to fruition the pleasing flower of my songs. Olympian 7. For Diagoras of Rhodes, winner in the boxing is when a man takes a cup in his wealthy hand, foaming inside with the dew of the vine and offers it to his young son-in-law, 
a cup which is the golden crown of his possessions, and toasts his exchange of homes, from one to another, both to mark the feast and to honor his new kin, and thus makes him envied in his friend's eyes because of his marriage, a well-matched meeting of minds, so in sending to prize winners in the games a stream of nectar, gift of the muses and sweet fruit of my mind, I propitiate them, victors at Olympia and Delphi. Happy is the man embraced by good report. The charm of poetry, often set to the sound of the sweet-toned lyre and the many-voiced pipe, gives vigor to life, and looks kindly now on one and now on another. And so to the accompaniment of both these instruments I have come ashore with Diagoras, singing of Rhodes, his island home, child of Aphrodite and bride of Helios, to praise this giant of a man, a straight fighter, who has won a crown for boxing by Alpheus River and at Castalia, and also to celebrate his father Damagetus, friend of justice. Their home is an island of three cities, close to a cape of broad Asia, set among Argive spearfighters. My hope is to make known a true account, starting from Tlapolemus, of their shared origin with the powerful race of Heracles. On Tlapolemus' side they claim descent from Zeus and on their mothers from Amintor, father of Astidemia. Over men's minds hang countless errors, it is impossible to discover what best can happen to man, both now and at the end. To illustrate, Tlapolemus, this land's founder, once a Tyran struck Alcmene's bastard brother Lysimnius with a staff of hard olive as he left Medea's chamber and killed him in a fit of anger. Even a wise man can be led astray by derangement of the mind. So Tlapolemus went to consult the god, and the golden-haired one spoke from his fragrant shrine, telling him to sail from Luna's shore straight to an island pasture. Where once the great king of the gods had sent down a shower of golden snow onto a city, when by Hephaestus' art and a stroke of his bronze-forged axe Athene sprang from the top of her father's head, yelling her monstrous war cry, and heaven shuddered at her and Mother Earth. Then it was that Hyperion's son, who brings light to mortals, instructed his dear sons to be sure to fulfill a future obligation, to be the first to erect a prominent altar to the goddess Athene, to institute a sacrifice and so to warm the heart of the virgin spear thunderer and of her father. Reverence, child of forethought, shoots excellence and joy into men's hearts, but for all that an unexpected cloud of forgetfulness comes over them and drags their minds away from the straight path of action. And so it was they went up, but did not take with them the seeds of bright flame, but established on the Acropolis a sacred grove with fireless offerings. Zeus called up a tawny-colored cloud and rained abundant gold on them, and the gray-eyed goddess herself gave them every kind of craft, so that they surpassed all mortals in the ingenuity of their hands. In their streets stood statues like living and moving beings, and their fame spread far abroad, for in an expert craftsman's skill flourishes when it is without artifice. Ancient tales of men relate that when Zeus and the immortal gods were giving out portions of the earth, Rhodes had not yet appeared in the open sea, but lay hidden in its salty depths. In his absence no one had allotted the sun god Helios a share, and so they left him, a revered god, without a portion of land. He complained of this to Zeus, who set about recasting the lots, but Helios stopped him, he saw, he said, a land rising from the depths of the grey sea, a land fruitful for men and bountiful to their flocks. At once Helios ordered Lachesis of the golden headband to raise her hands and to observe the god's great oath, and to undertake with Cronus' son that where the land had risen to the bright upper air it should for all time be his prize and possession. And so it fell out, the chief words of his speech were fulfilled, and an island sprang up from the watery sea, and Helios, father of the sun's piercing rays, lord of fire-breathing horses, now holds it as his own. Later he coupled with the nymph Rhodos and had by her seven sons, who inherited from him the wisest minds among men of former times. One sired Camerus and Ialysis his firstborn, and Lindus, these shared out their ancestral land in three ways, and each held his apportioned city apart, which now bear their names. Here was established for Tlapolemus, lord of the men of Tyrans, sweet requital for his miserable ill fortune, as if he were a god, a procession, reeking with the smoke of sacrificed beasts, and games where men are judged for prizes. In these Diagoras has twice been crowned with garlands, and has won four times at the famous Isthmus, time after time at Nemea, and in rocky Athens. The bronze at Argos came to know him well, as did the prizes in Arcadia and at Thebes and Boeotia's seasonal games and Pellene, 
as did Aegina, where he won six times, and Megara, with its stone record of victory, tells the same story. Father Zeus, Lord of Atabarian's mountain ridges, I pray you honor the custom of the Olympic victors him, and the man whose fists have won him success. Grant him popular respect among his townsmen and with strangers, for he walks on a straight road which abhors arrogant pride, and has learnt well the lesson which his upright mind, inherited from noble ancestors, has laid down for him. Do not obscure the lineage which he shares with Kalianax. Truly, when the Eratidae celebrate the city too holds festival. But in one short span of time winds quickly shift direction, veering back and forth. Olympian 8 For Alcimedon of Aegina, winner in the boys' wrestling mother of gold crown games, Olympia, queen of truth, where men who are seers interpret burnt offerings and test the mind of Zeus of the flashing thunderbolt, to see if he has any word for men who struggle in their hearts to win the rewards of excellence and respite from their labors, for men's prayers are fulfilled in accordance with their piety. O wooded grove of Pisa beside the Alpheus, I pray you welcome this victory revel, garlanded with crowns, great forever will be the glory of the man who is honored by your prize. Good fortune comes to men in different ways, and many are the paths to God-aided success. Timosthenes, destiny has allotted your clan to Zeus as its protector, who has brought you fame at Nemea, and has made your brother Alcimedon an Olympic victor beside the hill of Cronus. Handsome to look upon, his deeds matched his beauty, by his victory in the wrestling match he proclaimed Aegina of the long oars as his fatherland, where Themis the savior. Throned beside Zeus, protector of strangers, is especially honored among men. When much hangs in the balance and it inclines this way and that, a man may wrestle hard to make a straight, apt judgment, but some ordinance of the immortals has established this sea-bound land as a divine pillar of strength for strangers from every region. May future time never grow weary of this work. It is a land held in trust for the Dorian people, from the time of Aeacus, who was summoned by Leto's son, and by wide ruling Poseidon to help them build Troy's walls as they prepared to crown it with defenses, for it was fated that at war's onset Troy would in city-sacking battles breathe forth gusts of angry smoke. When the city was nearly built, three grey serpents tried to leap onto the wall, two fell back in terror and died there and then, but one leapt over with a triumphant cry. Apollo pondered this adverse omen, and at once spoke, Hero Aeacus, Pergamus will fall at the point where your hands have worked, this is what the vision sent by the loud thundering son of Cronus means to me. Your descendants will have a hand in this, it will begin in the first and fourth generations. So the god spoke clearly, and in haste drove his team off towards the Xanthus, to the Amazons with their fine horses, and to the Ister. But Poseidon the trident wielder urged his swift chariot towards the sea-lapped isthmus, returning Aeacus home behind his golden mares, while he himself went on to visit the mountain ridge of Corinth, famous for its festivals. Nothing will ever please all men equally. If my song has raced on to tell of Malaysia's fame, trainer of beardless boys, let not envy hurl a jagged stone at me, I shall also speak of a like success one at Nemea, and another there among men in the Pancration. In truth, teaching comes more easily to the man who already knows, and not to be prepared beforehand is stupidity, for the minds of the unpracticed are insubstantial things. But that man beyond all others can tell of his own successes, and the best way to advance the man who desires to win longed for glory from the holy games. And so now Alcimedon has brought him the honor of his thirtieth victory. With good fortune from the gods, and because he did not fail his manhood, he has shifted from himself onto the limbs of four boys the bitterest of returns, the jeering tongues, and the skulking journey home. He has breathed into his father's father the strength to wrestle with old age. Truly, the man who knows success forgets Hades. But I must rouse my memory and tell of the supreme achievement of hands which brought victory to the Blepsiad clan, the sixth crown to adorn them, given at the games where men win garlands, even the dead have a share in duly enacted rites, and the dust does not hide from them their kinsmen's prized success. Hearing from Hermes' daughter, the goddess of good news, Iphion will tell his uncle Callimachus of the glittering distinction Zeus has granted their family at Olympia. May Zeus be glad to heap glory upon glory for them, and shield them from painful disease. I pray he will not allot them a doubtful share of good things, but will grant them a trouble-free life, and cause them and their city to grow to greatness. Olympian 9
for Fr Mastas of Opus, winner in the wrestling Archilochus song, the loud high triple hymn of victory, chanted at Olympia, was good enough to conduct Fr Mastas past Cronus Hill when he reveled in triumph with his close companions. But scatter now from the muses far shooting bow a shower of arrows towards Zeus of the Crimson Lightning and towards the holy hill of Elis, which once the Lydian hero Pelops won as Hippodamia's splendid dowry. Shoot to a sweet feathered shaft towards Pytho. Your words will not fall to the ground when you make the lyre vibrate in honor of the wrestling skill of a man from famous Opus, as you praise the city and her son. For fate has allotted Opus to Themis and to her renowned daughter Eunomia, preserver of cities, and it thrives on the strength of its people's deeds by your waters, Castalia, and by the streams of Alpheus. And so the finest of crowns won in that place glorify the Locrian's mother city, famed for its beautiful trees. As for me, when I shed luster on that dear city with my blazing songs, faster than a thoroughbred horse or a winged ship I shall spread this news far and wide, if only by some fortune-driven skill I can cultivate choice flowers in the garden of the graces, it is they who allot pleasures, but only by divine agency do men become noble and wise. How else could Heracles have shaken his club against Poseidon's trident when the god stood before Pylos and pressed him hard? Or when Phoebus with his silver bow fought him and pressed him equally hard? Nor did Hades hold back from brandishing his staff at him, the staff with which he escorts the mortal bodies of the dead to his hollow streets below. But, my mouth, fling this story from me, for to speak ill of the gods is a depraved art, and loud untimely boasting sounds in harmony with madness. Do not babble of such things, keep war and fighting completely separate from the immortal gods. Rather lend your tongue to Protogenia's city, where by a decree of Zeus of the flashing thunderbolt Pyrrha and Deucalion came down from Parnassus and built their first home, and without intercourse created a single race from stones. And therefore they are called a people. Awake for them a clear-sounding path of poetry. Praise wine that is old, but for songs pick flowers that are new. Now, men say that once a mass of water deluged the dark earth, but by Zeus' artifice a backwash suddenly drained the flood away, and from these people first came your bronze-shielded forebears, sons of the daughters of Iapetus' race, and of Cronus' powerful sons, kings forever in their own land, until the lord of Olympus carried off Opus' daughter from the land of the Epians, and coupled with her in a secret place in Mienalus Dales. Later he gave her to Locris, so that time should not ruin him by awarding him a childless fate. Locris' wife was carrying a mighty seed in her, and the hero's heart was gladdened to see his counterfeit son, he gave him the name of his mother's father, and he grew to be a man beyond telling in beauty and great deeds, and Locris gave him his city and people to rule over. To him came strangers from Argos, from Thebes, from Arcadia, and from Pisa, but above all these settlers he honored Menoetius, son of Actor and Aegina, he whose son went with Atreus. Sons to the plain of Tuthras, and alone stood firm beside Achilles when Telephus routed the strong Danans and stormed their seagoing ships, and so discerning men saw and understood Patroclus' forceful spirit. From that time Thetis' son advised him never to take his stand in the murderous battle far away from his own manslaying spear. May I find the appropriate words to set out in the Muse's chariot, and may resolution and abundant power accompany me. Impelled by his success and by the ties of guest friendship, I came to honor Lampromachus Ismian crown, when on the same day both men were victorious. Later, there were two more joyful occasions for him at the gates of Corinth, and others for Epharmastus in the valley of Nemea. At Argos he won glory among men, and at Athens as a boy, and what a contest he endured at Marathon, where, deprived of the chance to challenge beardless boys, he competed with older men for silver cups. Without falling himself he threw men by nimble shifting feints, and left through the ring of spectators to noisy shouts, young and handsome, and the winner of handsome victories. And again, he won admiration among the people of Parasia at the festival for Lycaean Zeus, and also at Pelana where he won a warm antidote to cold winds. Iola's tomb and coastal Eleusis are true witnesses of his glorious deeds. Natural talents are the best in every way. Many have taken lessons in prowess, trying their utmost to achieve distinction, but without a god's help every achievement is best passed over in silence. Some roads reach further than others, and no single regime will develop us all. All skills lie on a steep path, 
but when you give him this prize raise a loud and confident shout that this man was with divine help born with quick hands and agile legs, and with courage in his eyes. At your feast, Ajax son of Ilias, he has set on your altar a victor's crown. Olympian 10. For Hagasidimus of Western Locri, winner in the boys' boxing read me the name of the Olympic victor, Archistratus' son, where it is written in my mind, for I owe him a sweet song, and have forgotten it. Come, muse, and you too, truth, daughter of Zeus, and with an amending hand keep me from the charge of breaking my word and wronging a friend. For the future has caught up with me from afar, and shamed me for my deep indebtedness. But payment with interest can free me from the sharpness of that reproach, as a rolling wave washes a tumbling pebble down the beach, so I shall fulfill our contract and win a favor between friends. Strict integrity rules the city of the western Locrians, and they pay heed to Calliope and brazen Ares. Even all-powerful Heracles was beaten back in battle with sickness. So now let Hagasidimus, boxing victor at the Olympic Games, give thanks to Ilus, as Patroclus did to Achilles. If a man is born for success, another may with a god's help sharpen his edge and drive him towards prodigious feats of glory, and without exertion few have one joy, which is a radiance in men's lives beyond all deeds. The ordinances of Zeus have roused me to sing of that special competition with its six altars which Heracles once established beside the ancient tomb of Pelops. He had killed Theaetus, Poseidon's handsome son, and Eurytus too, to compel payment from Augeus for the menial service he did him, willingly done, though Augeus was reluctant to pay him. In a copse below Cleone he lay in wait for them, and on the road he slew these haughty Molions, because before this they had crushed his Tyrinthian army, while it lay encamped in the dales of Elis. And indeed soon afterwards the Epian king, betrayer of guests, saw his rich homeland subside under pitiless fire and blows of iron into a deep trough of calamity. Conflict with those who are stronger cannot be avoided. So Augeus too at the end through his folly fell into captivity, and could not escape a sheer descent into death. Then Zeus' mighty son gathered his whole army and all its plunder at Pisa, and there measured out a sacred enclosure in honor of his great father. He fenced the altus round and marked it off in an open space, designated the plain around as a resting place for meals, and honored the Alpheus along with the twelve chief gods. He gave the hill of Cronus its name, for before that time, when Enemaus was king, it had had no name, but was covered deep in snow. At this firstborn ceremony the fates too stood close by, as did time, the only arbiter of absolute truth. Time as it travels onward has clearly revealed how Heracles divided up the spoils of war and made an offering of the choicest portion, and how he then founded the four-year festival with the first Olympiad and its victorious triumphs. Who then won the first fresh crown with hands, feet or chariot, planting glory in the games in his thoughts and winning it by his deeds? Lysimnius' son Aeonus ran best in the straight stretch of the Stadian race, he who had come from Medea, at the head of his army. In the wrestling, Achemus brought glory to Tegea. Doriclus, whose city was Tyrans, won the boxing prize, and in the four-horse chariot race Samus of Mantinia. Halorothea's son Fraster hit the mark with his javelin, while Nicias whirled the stone in his hand and threw it beyond all others, a great shout burst forth from the crowd, and the lovely light of the moon's fair face made the evening bright. The whole precinct rang with hymns of praise, sung at the joyful feast. So, following this ancient example, we shall in turn sing a song that takes its name from proud victory, extolling the thunder and fiery bolt of Zeus, the noise awakener, the blazing lightning that accompanies every triumph. Seductive melodies will respond to the pipes reed, songs which have at last come to light by famous Durse. But just as the heart of a man, now far from youth, is warmed with love for the long for son his wife has borne him, for when wealth passes into the charge of a stranger. A man from abroad, it torments a dying man, so, Hagasidimus, a man who has done noble deeds and reached the house of Hades without a song to praise him has wasted his breath and won but little pleasure from his toil. But on you the sweet-toned lyre and tuneful pipe are shedding fame, and the Pyrian daughters of Zeus spread your glory far afield. And I have eagerly added my support to the famous people of Locri, showering their city of fine men with honey. I have sung the praises of Archistratus' handsome son, whom I saw victorious by the strength of his hands on that day near Olympia's altar, 
beautiful to look upon, and endued with that youthfulness which once, through the help of the Cyprus-born goddess, saved Ganymede from pitiless death. Olympian 11. For Hagasidimus of Western Lockery, winner in the boys' boxing there is a time when men's greatest need is for winds, and another for the waters of heaven, rainy children of the clouds. But if a man wins success by his own efforts, then honey-sweet songs are a prelude to later words of praise, and a sure pledge of great achievements to come. For Olympic victors, such praise is stored up beyond the reach of envy. My tongue wishes to shepherd this praise, but it is only through a god's agency that a man's poetic skill grows to fruition. Hagasidimus, son of Archistratus, you should know that to extol your boxing victory, I shall add a sweet-voiced adornment to your crown of golden olive, and thus honor the people of Western Lockery. Muses, join in their triumphal revels, I promise it will be no inhospitable folk, nor people unacquainted with beauty that you will meet, but men highly skilled in poetry, and fine spearmen too. Truly, neither the ruddy fox nor the loud roaring lion can change its inborn nature. Olympian 12. For Ergoteals of Himera, winner in the long-distance race saved your fortune, daughter of Zeus the Deliverer, I pray to you, watch over Himera and keep its strength secure. For it is you who guide swift ships on the open sea, and on land order tumultuous battles and counsel-giving assemblies. But men's hopes are tossed up and down as they voyage through waves of empty lies. No man on earth has yet found out from the gods a sure token of things to come, man's perception is blinded as to the future. Many things fall out for men in ways they do not expect, sometimes their hoped-for pleasure is thwarted, sometimes, when they have encountered storms of pain, their grief changes in a moment to profound joy. Son of Philoner, the glory that your swift feet have brought you would have shed its leaves ingloriously, like a cock that fights only in its native yard, had not factional strife robbed you of Gnosis, your homeland. But, Ergoteals, now you have been crowned at Olympia, once too at the Isthmus and twice at Pytho, you bring fame to the nymphs' warm springs and live in a land that is now your own. Olympian 13 Xenophon of Corinth, winner of the short sprint race, and the pentathlon praising the house that is three times victor at Olympia, one kindly to its townsmen and hospitable to strangers, will lead me to learn of prosperous Corinth, gateway to Poseidon's Isthmus, city of brilliant young men. There lived good order in her sister Justice, a secure foundation for cities and peace, nurtured with them, dispenser of wealth for men, golden daughters of Themis of good counsel, eager to protect the city from insolence, loose-mouthed mother of excess. I have good things to tell, and an honest confidence impels my tongue to speak, inborn character cannot be concealed. To you, sons of Aeltes, the many-flowered seasons have often granted victory's glory, when, at the peak of your achievements, you triumphed at the sacred games, often they have put ancient expertise into your men's hearts. Everything looks back to its inventor, from where did the delights of Dionysus come and the dithyram that wins the ox prize? Who added the guiding bit to the harness of horses? Who set the twin kings of birds on the temples of the gods? Among this people the sweet-voiced muse thrives and Ares in its young men's death-dealing spears. Father Zeus on high, wide-ruling lord of Olympia, do not forever look with jealousy on my words but shield this people from harm and give a fair win to Xenophon's heaven-sent fortune. Welcome this ritual celebration, honoring the crowns he brings from Pisa's plain, victor in both the pentathlon and the stadion race, he has accomplished what no mortal man has reached before. When he appeared at the Isthmian Games two wreaths of wild celery crowned his head, nor will Nemia tell a different story. The brilliance of his father Thessalus' racing feet is recorded by the waters of Alpheus, and at Delphi he won fame in the double and single stadion race in one day. In the same month at rocky Athens one swift-footed day crowned his head with prizes for three splendid victories, and seven times was he honored at the Helotian Games. As for Poseidon's festival between the seas, it would need longer songs to do justice to his father Toeodorus and to Terpsius and Eurydamus. Touching your family's victories at Delphi, or in the lion's haunts, I must contend with many who tell of the great number of their successes, how indeed could I accurately number pebbles on the seashore? Each thing is attended by due measure, and to understand this brings the greatest profit.
I am a private passenger on a public voyage, and when I speak of the talents of their forefathers and their heroic deeds in war I shall give no false account of the people of Corinth, such as Sisyphus, subtle and inventive as a god, or Medea, savior of the ship Argo and its crew, putting her own marriage before her father's wishes. Again in time passed before the walls of Dardanian Troy they showed by their courage they could decide the battle's issue, one way or the other, some trying with Atreus' dear sons to win back Helen, others striving in every way to stop them. For the Danans trembled at the coming from Lycia of Glaucus, who claimed among them that his ancestor had ruled in Pyrene city, where there was a palace and a rich estate that were his. He it was who, in his desire to harness Pegasus, the snaky Gorgon's son, suffered much near the spring, at least until the maiden goddess Pallas brought to him a bit with its golden headstall, and his dream at once turned to waking vision. She said, Are you asleep, prince of Aeolus' race? Come, take this charmer of horses, sacrifice a white bull to your father the horse tamer, and show it to him. So it seemed to him that the maiden of the dark aegis had spoken to him as he slept. He sprang to his feet and seized the marvelous bit that lay beside him, and joyfully sought out the seer of the place, Coerinus' son, and explained all that had happened in the dream, how he had slept all night on the goddess's altar as she had instructed, and how the daughter of Zeus the thunderbolt hurler had herself given him the spirit-taming gold. The seer told him to obey the dream as fast as he could, he should sacrifice a strong-footed beast to the wide-ruling earth holder, and then at once set up an altar to Athene, goddess of horses. Even things beyond oath and hope are easily fulfilled by the god's power. And so mighty Bellerophon reached out and put the soothing charm about the winged horse's muzzle and subdued it. Quickly he mounted and armed in bronze began to wave his weapon in sport. Later, with his horse's help, he swooped down from the chilled gulfs of the empty upper air and laid low the army of the Amazons, female archers, and the fire-breathing Chimera and the Salami. About his fate I shall keep silent but his horse is still lodged in Zeus' ancient stables on Olympus. But as I whirl my many javelins on their straight course I must not hurl weapons from my hands so as to miss the mark, for I have come as a willing ally of the muses on their shining thrones, and to help the clan of Oligathity. As for their victories at the Isthmus and Nemea, a short word from me will make the sum total plain, and as a true sworn witness, the excellent herald's sweet-voiced cry, uttered sixty times at both games. Glad its confirmation. Their victories at Olympia have, it seems, already been told, and as for those in the future, I shall praise them when they come. I have my hopes for now, though the outcome lies with the god. If, with divine help, their clan continues to prosper, we can leave it to Zeus and Aeneleus to bring about success. Their victories under the brow of Parnassus were six, and there were the same number at Argos and at Thebes. Touching those in Arcadia's valleys, the regal altar of the Lycaean will bear witness, as too will Pelana and Sicyon and Megara, and the well-fenced precinct of the Eacids, Eleusis and gleaming Marathon, Euboea, and the fine rich cities under high-ridged Etna. If you search through all Hellas you will find more victories than the eye can see. Come, swim out with nimble feet. Zeus the accomplisher, grant them modesty and the sweet pleasures of good fortune. Olympian 14 for Aesopicus of Orchomenus, winner of the short sprint race O Graces, possessing the waters of Cephasus as your own, you who live in a land of fine horses, queens of gleaming Orchomenus, celebrated in song, guardians of the ancient race of minions, hear me when I pray to you. Through you all pleasures come to men, whether a man is a skilled poet, or handsome, or famous. Without the stately graces not even the gods can order dances or feasts, they are the stewards of all things in heaven and have set their thrones next to Pythian Apollo, lord of the golden bough, and they hold in reverence the everlasting dignity of their Olympian father. Lady Radiance, and you, good cheer, lover of song, children of the mightiest of the gods, hear me now, and you, festivity, who delight in song, as you watch this reveling procession, stepping lightly at his good fortune. For I have come singing of Aesopicus, composing in my accustomed way in the Lydian mode, because with your aid the city of the minions has triumphed at Olympia. Go now, Echo, to the black-walled house of Persephone and take this glorious news to his father Cleodemus, so that when you see him you may say of his son that in Pisa's famous valley he has crowned his youthful head with winged garlands from the games that bring renown. Pythians
Pythian won. For Hieron of Etna, winner of the chariot race Golden Lyre, possession and colleague of Apollo, and the violet-haired muses, to you the dancer's step listens, as it begins the bright celebration, and the singers obey your directions when with quivering strings you strike up the preludes which lead to the dance. You stifle even the warlike thunderbolt of ever-flowing fire, and the eagle, king of birds, sleeps on the scepter of Zeus, folding his swift wings to his sides, because you have poured a dark cloud over his bent head, a sweet shudder for his eyelids, in sleep he flexes his supple back, spellbound by your throbbing music. And violent Ares lays aside his cruelly pointed spear and warms his heart in sleep, for your shafts charm, even the hearts of gods, through the skill of Leto's son, and the muses with their deep folded robes. But creatures unloved by Zeus shudder when they hear the Pyrian's voice, whether on earth or in the relentless sea, and the one who lies in dreadful Tartarus, hundred-headed Typhos, enemy of the gods. Nurtured once by the far-famed cave of Cilicia, but now sea-fronting cliffs over Cumi press down on his shaggy breast, and the pillar of snow-covered Etna, rearing to heaven, year-long nurse of freezing snow, pins him down. From its depths spew sacred founts of fire that cannot be approached, by day rivers pour forth lurid streaks of smoke, and by night a crimson rolling flame sweeps down rocks, which crash into the sea's broad expanse. That monster spouts forth terrifying torrents of Hephaestus fire, a prodigious portent to behold, and a wonder for visitors to hear. Such a thing is imprisoned between Etna's dark wooded peaks and its plain, and the bed he lies on gouges and galls the whole length of his back. Grant, O Zeus, grant that I may please you, watcher over this mountain, forehead of a fertile land, whose neighbor namesake city was made glorious by its famous founder when at Pytho's racecourse the herald proclaimed it, telling of Hieron's splendid victory in the chariot race. For men who sail in ships the first sign of favor as they embark is the rising of a following wind, because then there is a fair chance that they will enjoy a safe return to at the end of their voyage. And this saying, on the back of such success, brings hope that the city will be famed in future for crowns won with horses, and renowned for its festivals of sweet music. Phoebus, lord of Lycia and ruler of Delos, lover of Castalia's spring at Parnassus, be willing to store my wish in your heart and make this a land of brave men. All mortal achievement stems from the gods' designs, thus are born skilled poets and men of strong hands and great eloquence. Eager to praise that famous man, I hope I do not, as one might say, throw the bronze-tipped javelin I spin with my hand outside the field of play, but surpass my competitors by the length of my cast. May his whole life continue to steer happiness and the gift of wealth towards him, bringing him forgetfulness of past hardship. Time will surely remind him of the battles where he stood his ground with unflinching spirit, when with the gods' help he and his family won honor such as no Hellene has ever reaped, a lordly crown of riches. And now indeed he went to war like Philoctetes, compelling even a proud man to fawn on him as a friend. Men say that godlike heroes came to fetch him, Poes Archer's son, from Lemnos, exhausted by his wound, and so he sacked Priam's city and brought the Danans' labors to an end. He walked with a sick body, but this was how it was fated. Just so may the god preserve Hieron in time to come, giving him the opportunity to grasp what he desires. And, Muse, let me persuade you to sing too in Danamine's house of the reward for the four-horse chariot, for his father's victory is no alien joy. Come, let us devise a welcome song for Etna's king, for whom Hieron founded that city with God-built freedom, according to the ordinances of Hillis' rule for the descendants of Pamphilus, and indeed of Heracles' sons, who live under the heights of Teogetus, desire as Dorians always to keep to the statutes of Egemius. They came down from Pindus and occupied Amicle in prosperity, and were renowned neighbors to the Tindarids of the White Horses, and the fame of their spears increased. Zeus, accomplisher, grant that such a destiny may always hold good for Etna's citizens and kings beside the waters of Amenas, a true record on the lips of men. For if you help him, a ruler who advises his son well may by honoring his people turn them towards harmonious peace. I pr pray you, son of Cronus, grant that the war cry of Phoenicians and Etruscans may stay at home, now that they have seen their insolent violence bring lamentation on their fleet for what it endured at Cumi, crushed by the Syracusan commander, who hurled their finest men from their swift ships into the sea and rescued Greece from harsh slavery.
From Salamis I shall earn the Athenians thanks as payment, and in Sparta for my tale of the battles before Scythiaran, where the Medes who shoot with curved bows were overcome. But by the well-watered bank of Himera my reward shall be for the song I have made for Danamine's sons, which they earned by their courage when their enemies were overthrown. If you should speak in keeping with the occasion, plating the threads of many matters into a brief whole, men will find less fault with you, for wearisome excess blunts the edge of keen expectancy. And in their secret hearts men are especially oppressed when they hear praise of other citizens. Nevertheless, since it is better to be envied than pitted, do not deviate from your noble course. Steer your people with the rudder of justice and forge your tongue on the anvil of truth. You know that even a trivial word can carry great influence if it leaps like a spark from your mouth. You hold great wealth and trust, and there are many men to bear reliable witness to your acts, for good or ill. Retain the full vigor of your spirits, and if it pleases you to hear that men always speak well of you do not grow weary of spending, but like a steersman let your sail out to catch the wind. My friend, do not be taken in by unworthy use of wealth, for the award of posthumous fame is the only testimony that storytellers and poets can give to the lives of the dead. Croesus' generous virtues do not fade, but he who burnt men in his brazen bull, Phalaris, is dogged by an evil report throughout the world, and no liars in men's halls welcome him to the soft embrace of boys' voices. Success is the best prize, and the next best destiny is a good reputation, but the man who lights on both and holds them fast wins the highest crown. Pythian II. For Hieron of Syracuse, winner of the chariot race Syracuse, great city, sanctuary of Ares who lives in the thick of war, divine nurse of horsemen who delight in iron, I come to you from gleaming Thebes bringing this song which tells of an earth-shaking four-horse team, how Hieron, possessor of fine chariots, won the prize, and with far-shining wreaths crowned Ortygia, home of river goddess Artemis, not without her aid did he tame with gentle hands those colts with their richly worked reins. For it is the maiden goddess, delighting in the bow, who with Hermes, god of the games, fits the bright harness with both hands, when Hieron yokes his strong horses to the polished car and to the chariot that governs the bit, calling on the wide ruling god, the trident holder. As tribute to their success men pay kings sweet-sounding songs. Often the men of Cyprus sing of Cenyras, whom golden-haired Apollo gladly befriended, and who was Aphrodite's favorite priest, for reciprocal favor is paid in return for deeds of friendship. You, son of Danamines, are extolled in front of her house by a maiden of western Locri, because after desperate struggles of war she now, because of your power, gazes out with confidence. Ixion, they say, whirling wildly on his will by the gods' decree, speaks these words to mortals, repay your benefactor, always meeting him with gentle acts of recompense. He learnt this lesson in unambiguous terms, for though he had won an agreeable life with the friendly children of Cronus he did not enjoy his happiness for long, since in his crazy heart he conceived a passion for Hera, whose duty it was to bring pleasure to the bed of Zeus. Insolence drove him into presumptuous folly, and he quickly suffered his deserts, earning exquisite torment for himself. Two crimes brought punishment on this hero. He was the first to pollute mortals with the taint of kindred bloodshed, not without cunning, and once in the recesses of her great bedchamber he made an attempt to rape the wife of Zeus. One must always gauge everything by one's own station. Illicit sexual passions hurl men into utter ruin, and they also proved his undoing, for, ignorant man, he pursued a lovely deception and coupled with a cloud, which mimicked the shape of heaven's supreme goddess, the daughter of Cronus. Zeus' ingenuity contrived this as a trap for him, a beautiful misfortune. And so he earned his own ruin, bound to the four-spoked wheel. Caught in inescapable bonds, he was given a message that touches us all. That singular mother bore him a singular monstrous son without the grace's favor, one not honored among men or in the gods' society. She raised it and called it Centaurus, and it mated with Mares of Magnesia in the foothills of Pelion, from which sprang a remarkable brood, resembling both its parents, the mother's parts below, and the father's above. A god accomplishes his every plan as he intends, a god, who can outstrip even the winged eagle and overtake the dolphin of the sea, who forces many a haughty mortal to yield while giving others eternal glory. I must avoid the violent bite of slander, 
In times long gone I have seen the censorious Archilochus often suffering because he fattened himself on harsh words of hatred. Wealth allied to good fortune is the best destiny poetic wisdom can give. You clearly possess this, and can display it with a liberal spirit, ruler and master of many well-fortified streets and of a numerous people. If anyone today says that another man of former times in Greece was superior to you in possessions and reputation, he is empty-minded and wrestles to no purpose. To proclaim your prowess I shall board a flower-garlanded ship. In terrible wars youth is supported by boldness, and I say that there too you have acquired your boundless glory, on campaigns with horsemen and with foot soldiers. Your counsels, mature in your later years, allow me to praise you freely on every account. Farewell, this song is sent to you over the grey sea like Phoenician merchandise. As for the other, the song of Castor sung to Aeolian strings, look favorably upon it, the splendor of the seven-stringed lyre, as you meet it. You have learnt what kind of a person you are, now become that man. In the eyes of children, as we know, the ape is a handsome thing, always handsome, but Radamanthes prospers because fate has allotted him the excellent fruit of a sound mind, and in his heart he takes no pleasure in the kind of deceptions that always keep mortals company, through whisperer's artfulness. Spreaders of slander cause irresistible harm to both parties, for their natures are exactly those of foxes. But what real gain comes from this kind of trickery? None, for while the rest of the fisherman's gear does its work in the sea's depths, I am like a cork bobbing unsubmerged on its salt surface. A dishonest citizen cannot utter weighty words in good men's company, but such a man will fawn on everyone, weaving his webs of delusion. I wish no part in his audacity. Let me be a friend to my friend, but my enemy, since I am his enemy, I shall hunt down like a wolf, tracking him here and there on zigzag paths. In every polity the straight-speaking man is best, whether under a tyranny, or when the violent mob or the wise watch over it. One should not fight against the god, who now raises a man up and then again gives great glory to others. But not even this thought cheers the minds of the envious, who stretch the measuring line too tight and so inflict a painful wound in their own heart before they can achieve what they have devised in their minds. It is best to accept the yoke on one's neck and bear it lightly, truly, kicking against the goad makes for a slippery path. May it be my fate to enjoy the approval of good men and to keep their company. Pythian 3. For Hieron of Syracuse if it is right for my tongue to speak this communal prayer, I would wish that the now dead Chiron, son of Philera and wide ruling Sion of Cronus son of Uranus, were still alive, and that he were still lord in Pelion's valleys, a wild untamed creature, but with a heart that loved men, just as he was when long ago he reared that gentle divisor of limb healing relief from pain, Asclepius, the hero who protects men against every kind of disease. Before the time had come for her to give birth to him with the help of Elythia, attendant of mothers, the daughter of Phlegias the horseman was brought low in her bedchamber by the golden arrows of Artemis, and went down to Hades' house by Apollo's devising. The anger of Zeus' children is no slight thing. Yet she in her mind's folly had rebuffed him, and had agreed without her father's knowledge to another marriage, though she had already lain with Phoebus of the unshorn hair and was carrying the pure seed of the god. She would not wait for the wedding feast to come, nor the sound of the many-voiced bridal hymn which a girl's unwed companions chant in affectionate evening songs, but she was infatuated with far-off things, a craving which many others have suffered. There is among mankind a very foolish breed, who disdain familiar things, and look with longing at what is out of reach, seeking the impossible with hopes that will never be fulfilled. Such was the strong delusion which seized the mind of Coronis, she of the lovely robes. She lay in the bed of an Arcadian stranger, but she did not escape the one who watched her, for though he was then in sheep receiving Pytho Loxia's lord of his temple was aware of her, trusting in his omniscient mind, his unerring companion, he has no truck with lies, and no mortal or god can outweet him either in words or in deeds. And so now, when he realized her impious duplicity, that she was bedded with the stranger Ishi son of Elatus, he sent his sister, wild with resistless anger, to Lasaria beside the steep shores of Boebias, where the girl lived. A contrary doom struck her down and hurled her into disaster, and many of her neighbors suffered and died with her, a fire that starts from one spark can destroy a great forest. 
But when her relatives had laid the girl inside a wall of wood, and the ravening brightness of Hephaestus had enveloped her, then Apollo spoke, I can no longer bear in my heart to destroy my own offspring in a most pitiful death, together with his mother's hard suffering. So he spoke, and in one stride reached the pyre, and caught up the child from the corpse, and the burning flames opened a way for him. He took the child and gave him to the centaur of Magnesia to teach him how to cure men of their painful infirmities. And so if any came to him with chronic sores as constant companions, or with limbs wounded by the grey bronze, or a far-flung stone, or whose body was wasted by summer fever or winter cold, he relieved them of their several pains and so restored them to health. Some he treated with emollient incantations, others with potions, and for others he applied salves all over their bodies, while others he set back on their feet by surgery. But even skill can become the prisoner of gain. Gold displayed in the hand was a princely inducement for even him to recall from death a man already in its grip. The son of Cronus tore the breath from both in a moment, and with his hands heaved the blazing thunderbolt dealt them death. Men should seek from the gods only what is consistent with mortal minds, knowing what lies before our feet, and the nature of our destiny. Do not, my soul, long for an immortal life, but make the most of what you can realistically achieve. If sagacious Chiron were still living in his cave, and my sweet songs could somehow thrust a charm into his heart, then I would surely have persuaded him to grant us a healer of feverish diseases for mortals, one named as a son of Leto's child or of his father. And I would have come by ship, slicing through the Ionian Sea, to the spring of Arethusa to see my guest friend of Etna, who governs the Syracusans as king, one gentle to his fellow citizens, open-handed to the good, and a remarkable father to strangers. If I had landed there, bringing him a double favor, golden health, and a triumphant revel, brilliance added to the crowns from the Pythian games which Phrenicus once won at Syrah, I say I would have come to him as a light that shines brighter than any star in the heaven when I had crossed the deep sea. But I wish to pray to the mother, the revered goddess, to whom, with Pan, girls often sing before my door at night. If you, Hieron, can understand the true meaning of sayings, you will have learnt this lesson from men of old, that for every blessing the immortals hand men a double grief. Fools cannot wear this with dignity, but good men can, by turning the better side outward. But as for you, a happy fate awaits you, for surely if great destiny looks favorably on anyone it is on a ruler who leads his people. But a secure life did not stay with Peleus, Aeacus' son, nor with godlike Cadmus, yet men say they enjoyed the greatest happiness of any mortal, for they even heard the gold-capped muses singing on the mountain and its seven-gated Thebes, the one when he wedded Harmonia, and the other glorious Thetis, daughter of straight-counseling Nereus. Moreover the gods feasted with both, and they saw the kingly sons of Cronus on their golden thrones and received from them wedding gifts. By Zeus' favor they put their former hardships behind them and lifted up their hearts with confidence. But things changed with time, and later the painful sharp sufferings of his three daughters deprived the one of part of his happiness, though Father Zeus did come to the desirable bed of white-armed thy one. And the other's son, the only child immortal Thetis bore to him in Thyia, lost his life in war to an arrow, and roused a lament among the Danans when his corpse was consumed by fire. If a man holds to the path of truth in his mind he must be content with whatever the blessed gods send him. Gusts of soaring winds blow now this way, now that, lasting prosperity does not visit men for long, even when it has attended them with all its weight. I shall be small when times are small, and great when they are great. Whatever fortune comes my way I shall respect it with my mind and nurture it according to my powers. If a god should hold out luxurious wealth to me I hope I shall use it to acquire glory in time to come. It is from sonorous verses such as skillful poets constructed that we know of Nestor and Lysian Sarpedon, the talk of men. Glory-giving songs cause excellence to abide for ages, but few men find them easy to acquire. Pythian 4 for our say Silas of Cyrene, winner of the chariot race today, my muse, you must stand at the side of a friend, our say Silas, king of Cyrene of the fine horses, so that with him in his victory revel you may swell the winds of song which are owed to Leto's children and to Pytho, where once the priestess who sits near Zeus' golden eagles foretold, in Apollo's presence, that Battus would settle in fruitful Libya, that he should now leave the holy island and found a city of fine chariots on that. Land's white breast, and so fulfill, in the seventeenth generation, 
the words Medea's immortal mouth once breathed out on Thera, mistress of Colchis, and meddlesome daughter of Eats. Thus she spoke to the spearman Jason's demigod crew, Listen to me, sons of high-spirited men and gods, I tell you that one day from this sea-beaten island the daughter of Epiphus will plant a root from which cities revered by men will spring, near the foundations of Zeus Ammon. In place of short thin dolphins their people will raise swift horses, and instead of oars they will handle reins and chariots with the speed of the storm. This sign will bring it to pass that Thera will become the mother city of great cities, the symbol which Euphamus once received when he leapt from his ship's prow at Lake Tritone's outflow, and a god in the likeness of a man gave him a clod of earth as a guest present, and Father Zeus, son of Cronus, crashed out a thunderclap in confirmation at the time when he found us hanging the bronze fluked anchor, swift Argo's bridle, against the ship. Before this, we had dragged our seagoing craft onto the shore in accordance with my designs, and for twelve days had been carrying it from ocean over desert tracts of land. It was then that the god drew near to us, alone, having assumed the glorious appearance of a man of esteem. His first words were friendly, such as hospitable men use when they invite newly arrived strangers to a feast. But the excuse of our sweet return home prevented us from staying. He said he was Eurypylus, son of the immortal holder and shaker of the earth. He knew we were anxious to leave, but straightway caught up some earth in his right hand and pressed it on Euphamus as a makeshift guest present. The hero did not resist him, but jumped down onto the shore, grasped his hand firmly in his own, and accepted the godsent clod. I hear that one evening it was washed off the ship by a wave and fell into the sea, and took its course over the watery expanse. Many times indeed I had urged the servants who lighten our labor to keep it safe, but their minds were forgetful and so the undying seed of spacious Libya has been washed up on this island before its time. For if you famous, kingly son of Poseidon tamer of horses, whom Europa, Titius' daughter, once bore to him by Cephas's banks, had returned home to holy Tynaris and thrown it down near the earth's portal to Hades, the blood in the fourth generation of his children would have taken possession of that broad mainland with the Danans, for at that time they are to rise up and leave great Lacedaemon, and the Argive Gulf, and Mycenae. But as it is, he will find in the beds of foreign women a chosen race, who honored by the gods will come to this island and will father a man to be lord of those dark clouded plains. In time to come he will make a journey to Pytho's temple, and Phoebus in his gold-rich palace will remind him through oracles to transport cities and ships to the rich precinct of Cronus' son by the Nile. Such were the oracular utterances of Medea. And the godlike heroes stood in motionless silence, awestruck as they listened to her deep counsel. It was you, blessed son of Polymnastus, whom the oracle celebrated in this speech, through the unsolicited cry of the Delphic bee. Three times she greeted you and revealed you as Cyrene's destined king when you had inquired of her what release there might be from the gods for your stammering speech. And so it turned out, later, as it were at the height of red-flowering spring, the eighth generation of his line flourishes in Arce Silas. Apollo and Pytho have granted him renown among surrounding peoples for his chariot racing. As for me, I shall offer him to the muses, and with him the ram's all golden fleece, for it was when the minions set sail in search of it that God sent honors were planted for them. What caused them to begin their voyage? What prospect of danger bound them with strong nails of adamant? There was an oracle that Peleus would die at the hands of the lordly Elids, or by their inescapable intrigues. Prophecy came to him that froze his wily heart, one delivered at the mother's central navel stone, thick with trees, that he should take all possible precautions against the man with one sandal when he should come, a stranger or a fellow citizen, from his mountain home to the sunlit land of famous Iolcus. And indeed in time he did come, a striking man, carrying twin spears. He wore two kinds of clothing, native Magnesian garments covered his splendid limbs, and a leopard skin shielded him against the chilling rain. His bright long hair was not shorn and lost, but streamed down the whole length of his back. Swiftly he strode into the marketplace and stood among the thronging crowd, putting his unflinching purpose to the test. They did not recognize him, but as they stood stunned one of them said, This surely cannot be Apollo, nor Aphrodite's husband of the bronze chariot, and men say the sons of Iphimedia died in bright Naxus, Otis, and you, daring King Ephialtes. 
and certainly Titius was hunted down by Artemis' swift arrow, shot from her invincible quiver, so that men might desire to reach only those pleasures which are within their power. While they talked among themselves in this way, Peleus arrived at headlong speed in his polished mule-drawn car. The moment he caught sight of the conspicuous single sandal on the man's right foot he was dumbfounded, but concealed his fear in his heart and said, What land do you claim as your own, stranger? And what earth-born woman dropped you out of her grey womb? Tell me your ancestry, and do not pollute it with repellent lies. He answered him with confident and mild words, I declare that I shall exemplify the teachings of Chiron, for I come from the cave of Chiriclo and Philera, where the centaur's holy daughters reared me. Twenty years I spent there, with never an untoward deed or word to them, and now I have come to my home to repossess my father's ancient privilege, the kingship held unlawfully, which long ago Zeus gave to Aeolus. Leader of his people, and to his sons, since I hear that the lawless Peleus has yielded to unjust thoughts and has violently stripped it from my parents, the rightful rulers, they, as soon as ever I saw the light, fearing the brutal insolence of an arrogant ruler, arranged a gloomy funeral in the palace, as if I had died, and amid the keening of women secretly sent me away wrapped in red swaddling clothes, making the knight the confidant of my journey, and gave me to Chiron the son of Cronus to be raised. So now you know the bare facts of my story. Good citizens, show me clearly the palace of my fathers, lords of white horses, for as Ezin's son I am a native here, and it is to no alien land that I have come. The divine beast called me by the name of Jason. So he spoke, and went into his home, and his father's eyes knew him, and tears gushed forth from behind his aged eyelids, and he rejoiced in his heart seeing his incomparable son, most handsome of men. At the news of his coming Ezin's two brothers appeared, fears from the nearby spring of Hypris and Amythaon from Messene. And quickly Admetus and Melampus too arrived, full of kindly feeling towards their cousin. While they feasted Jason welcomed them with gracious words, offering them due hospitality, and prolonging the entertainment in all kinds of ways for fully five nights and days, plucking the holy flower of festive enjoyment. But on the sixth day he set out in sober words the whole story from the start, and shared it with his kinsmen, and they sided with him. At once he rose with them from their couches, going to the palace of Peleus they entered quickly and took their stand. When he heard them, lovely-haired Tyro's son met them in person. In a soft voice Jason poured gentle words over him, and so laid the foundation of wise speech, son of Poseidon of the rock, men's minds are all too quick to applaud dishonest gain above the right course of action, even though they will come to a hard reckoning on the morning after. Still, you and I must control our passions with the rule of law, and so we've happiness for the future. You know what I am going to say, Cretheus and reckless Salmonius were born to one heifer mother, and we are descended in the third generation from them, and look upon the might of the sun. The fates stand apart from kinsmen if there is enmity between them, causing them to conceal their respect for one another. It is not right for the two of us to divide up the great possessions of our ancestors by means of sharp bronze swords or spears. I surrender to you the sheep flocks, the herds of tawny cattle, and all the land which you have stolen from my parents and now control, fattening up your wealth. It does not grieve me that all this immoderately feeds your house, but as for the scepter of sole authority, and the throne where Cretheus' son Ezin formerly sat and handed down straight judgments to his horsemen people, yield these up to me, without hurt to either, lest some new trouble arise for us as a result. So he spoke, and Peleus answered softly, I shall do as you say. But old age is now my life's portion and keeps me company, while the flower of your youth now swells in bloom, and you have the power to dispel the anger of powers below the earth, Phrixus commands us to bring his spirit home, by going to the palace of Eats and fetching here the thick-fleeced hide of the ram by whose help he was once saved from the open sea and from his stepmother's godless weapons. A strange dream came to me and told me this. I went to consult the oracle at Castalia to see if some search should be undertaken, and it urges me to prepare a seagoing expedition as soon as possible. Agree to perform this undertaking, and I swear I shall surrender to you both kingship and sole rule. May Zeus our common ancestor be our witness, that this is a mighty oath. So they willingly made this agreement, and parted. But Jason himself forthwith sent heralds everywhere to announce that a naval expedition was planned. 
Without delay there came three sons of Zeus the son of Cronus, tireless in battle, whose mothers were glancing-eyed Alcmene and Leda, also two long-haired men, sons of the Earthshaker, from Pylos and Tynaris, conscious of their reputation for valor. Thus was you famous noble fame secured, and yours, mighty Periclymenus. And sent by Apollo there came the lyre player and father of song, greatly admired Orpheus. Hermes of the Golden Staff sent his twin sons for this task which had no end, Echion and Eridus, exulting loudly in their youth. From their homes in the foothills of Pangaean came two swift men, Zets and Calais, for their father Boreas, lord of the winds, quickly sent them with a willing and cheerful heart, two men whose backs both bristled with purple wings. Hera kindled in these gods sons an irresistible sweet desire for the ship Argo, so that none of them was left behind at his mother's side to brood over a life without danger, but each discovered among his fellows the finest physic for his excellence, even in the face of death. When the flower of seafarers landed at Iolcus, Jason congratulated and marshaled them, and the seer Mopsus, divining from birds and from sacred lots, sent them on board with a good grace. When they had hung their anchors up on the prow, their chief Jason lifted a golden bowl in his hands, and standing on the stern called upon Zeus, father of heaven's inhabitants, whose spear is the lightning, and upon the swing of the waves to speed their way, and upon the winds and nights and days and paths of the open sea to show them favor, and bring them the longed for destiny of a return home. From the clouds an auspicious clap of thunder crashed in answer, and vivid flashes of lightning burst forth. Trusting in these signs from the god, the heroes took fresh heart, and, voicing their joyful hopes, the seer called them to fall to their oars. Under their fast-moving hands the tireless rowing advanced. Sped on by the south wind's breezes, they reached the mouth of the inhospitable sea, there they established a precinct sacred to Poseidon, god of the sea, and there was nearby a herd of reddish Thracian cattle, and a newly built altar of stone with a flat top. About to launch themselves into deep danger, they prayed to the lord of ships to escape from the irresistible motion of the clashing rocks. There were two of these, and they were alive, and rolled along more swiftly than columns of deep bellowing winds, but this expedition of demigods finally brought about their end. Then they came to the Phasis, and fought with all their strength against the dark-faced Colchians before Eats himself. And there it was that the Cyprus-born goddess, mistress of sharpest arrows, first brought from Olympus to mend the speckled Rhinac, the bird of frenzy, and bound it helplessly to a four-spoked wheel. She fully instructed Ezin's son in the skill of prayers and spells, so that he might wrench Medea away from respect for her parents, and so that desire for Hellas might with persuasions whip unsettle her. Whose heart was already aflame. Quickly she showed him how to perform the tasks her father would set. Mixing drugs with oil she concocted antidotes to agonizing pain, and gave them to him to smear on himself, and they vowed they would be joined to each other in the sweet union of marriage. But when Eats had set before all a plough of adamant, an oxen which breathed flames of burning fire from their tawny jaws, and which tore up the ground with the pawing of their bronze hoofs, he controlled them and forced them single-handed under the yoke strap. The furrows stretched in straight lines as he drove them on, splitting the back of the clawed earth six feet deep. Then he said, this is the task which your king, whoever he is who commands your ship, must complete for me, after that he may take away the imperishable coverlet, the fleece which glistens with its fringe of gold. So he spoke. Jason threw off his saffron cloak and, trusting in the god, set his hand to the task. By the commands of the foreign woman, skilled in all drugs, the fire did not cause him to flinch. Drawing up the plow he forcibly bound the harness onto the bull's necks, and driving the relentless goad into their huge and powerful sides, this powerful man completed his allotted task. Eats let out a cry, albeit of wordless anguish, amazed at the man's strength. Meanwhile his companions were holding out their hands to the mighty man and crowning him with wreaths of grass, congratulating him with honey-sweet words. Then the marvelous son of Helios told him where Phrixus knives had staked out the shining fleece, but he did not expect him to accomplish that labor too, for it lay in a coppice close to the ravening jaws of a serpent, which in thickness and strength was bigger than a fifty-oared ship, built by blows of iron tools. But it is too far for me to travel by the high road, for time presses. I know a short way, on which I lead many others in poetic skill. 
Arce Silas, by guile he killed the grey-eyed serpent with its mottled back, and with her willing help stole Medea away, who would kill Peleus. They reached the broad stretch of ocean, the Red Sea, and the country of the manslaying Lemnian women, there in athletic contests they competed with limb strength for the prize of a garment and slept with the women. It was then, in foreign furrows, that the destined days or nights received the seed of your family's bright prosperity, for there the race of Euphamus was sown and has endured ever since. They made their homes among men of Lacedaemon, and in later times settled on the island of Caliste, from their Lido's son gave you the plain of Libya to make it fruitful through the favor of the gods, and to govern the divine city of golden throne Cyrene, since you have discovered the discretion that comes from right judgment. Learn now the wisdom of Oedipus, if a man with a sharp blade lops off a shoot from a great oak and disfigures its glorious form, even though it can no longer bear leaves it casts a vote in its own favor, whether it comes at the end to a fire in winter or, sustained by upright pillars in a master's house, it performs a cheerless labor in an alien building, having abandoned its native place. You are a most timely healer, and Pian honors your power to save. To treat a festering wound you must apply a gentle hand, it is easy, even for weaklings, to throw a city into convulsion, but to establish it again in its place is hard indeed, unless a god suddenly appears to steer its leaders. For you, the pleasure that comes from doing this is now being woven into a fabric. Be patient and devote your whole energy to serving prosperous Cyrene. And among Homer's sayings take this to heart and cherish it, he said that in all affairs a good messenger brings the greatest honor, even the muse is exalted by a truthful report. Cyrene and the distinguished house of Battus have come to know the good sense of Demophilus, he is young among the young, but in deliberations he is an old man who has seen a hundred years, he robs the wicked tongue of its clamorous voice, and has learned to hate the arrogant, but he does not fight against the good, nor yet delays the fulfillment of any undertaking, for opportunity's moment lasts, but a short space for men. He knows this well, and serves it as a steward, not as a hired man. The cruelest thing, they say, is to know the good but to be forced to stand apart from it. And in truth he, like Atlas, now struggles under the weight of heaven, far from his own land and possessions, and yet immortal Zeus set the titans free again. In time, the wind dies down and sails are set again. He prays that now he has drained his malignant sickness to the dregs he may one day see his home. And may it Apollo's spring join in symposia and many times pledge his heart to the pleasures of youth, and in the company of discerning citizens may hold the decorated lyre in his hands and attain peace, causing no harm to anyone nor suffering it himself at the hands of his fellow citizens. Then, Arce Silas, he could tell what a spring of immortal verse he found when he was recently a guest in Thebes. Pythian 5 For Arce Silas of Cyrene, winner of the chariot race wide is the strength of wealth, when a mortal man receives it from destiny's hand and joining it with unsullied excellence, takes it as an attendant who brings him many friends. O Arce Silas, favored by the gods, you have surely been searching for this, along with glory, from the first steps of your brilliant life, through the goodwill of Castor of the golden chariot, who after winter's rain spreads a bright calm over your blessed hearth. In truth, the wise handle power in a more noble fashion, even when it is given by a god. And so with you, as you walk the way of justice, great prosperity surrounds you, first, because you are a king, and the inherited prestige of great cities brings with it this most revered dignity. When it is allied to judgment, and then, you are now blessed because you have won glory at the famous Pythian games in the chariot race, and so have received this celebratory revel of men, which brings delight to Apollo. Do not then forget, as your praise is sung in Aphrodite's pleasant garden at Cyrene, to attribute all your success to the god, and also to hold Carotus dear above all your companions. When he returned to the palace of the Batidae, just rulers, he did not bring with him excuse the daughter of hindsight, but after being entertained beside Castalia's waters he crowned your head with the victorious chariot's prize, won with reins unimpaired through the twelve swift laps of the sacred course. For he shattered none of his strong equipment, and now all that intricate work of skilled craftsmen which he drove when he crossed the ridge of Cresa, on his way to the god's deep valley, is hung up in dedication. A chamber of cypress wood encloses it, near the statue, cut in one piece from the living wood which bow-wielding Cretan set up in the temple on Parnassus. 
It is therefore proper to greet one's benefactor with enthusiasm. And on you, son of Alexei Bias, the fair-haired graces have shed brightness. You are blessed, in that after great exertion, you have a memorial of mighty words of praise. Forty charioteers fell, but you kept your chariot intact with fearless spirit, and have now returned from the glorious games to the plain of Libya and your ancestral city. No one is without his allotted share of toil, nor will be. Yet the age-old prosperity of Battis persists, though the fortune it confers varies this way and that, it is a strong tower for the city, and for strangers a bright splendor. Even deep roaring lions fled from him in fear when he addressed them in his curious speech, Apollo the colony's founder filled the beasts with sheer terror, so that the oracles he gave to Cyrene's steward should not be unfulfilled. Apollo it is who dispenses cures for painful diseases to men and women, he has also given them the lyre, granting the muse to whoever he wishes, instilling peace and good order in their hearts. He is present in the secret places of his oracle, from where he caused the mighty sons of Heracles and of Egemius to settle in Lacedaemon and Argos and Holy Pilus. He makes known that my cherished glory is from Sparta, whence sprang the Aegeidae, my ancestors, who came to Thera, not without the god's favor, but some fate led them. From there we have inherited a communal meal of many sacrifices, your Carnea, Apollo, and at your feast we honor Cyrene's well-built city. Here live the Trojans who delight in bronze weapons, the sons of Antenor, for they came here with Helen after they had witnessed their own land swathed in the smoke of war. And that chariot-driving people is duly welcomed with sacrifices and hailed with gifts by those whom Aristoteles brought in swift ships, opening up a deep path through the salt sea. He planted larger sacred groves for the gods, and laid down a straight broad way, to be a paved road, sounding to the hammer of horses' hoofs at processions in honor of Apollo, who brings help to mortals. There at the far end of the marketplace, he lies apart in death, blessed when he lived among men, and thereafter revered by the people as a hero. Separate from him before the palace lie the other holy kings whose destiny places them in Hades. It may be that in their minds below the earth they can hear of these great deeds of prowess, sprinkled with soft dew and accompanied by waves of revel song. Bringing them happiness for themselves and a just share with their son Arce Silas in his distinction. It is right for him to invoke Phoebus of the golden sword in songs of young men, since he has been repaid from Pytho by this elegant victory song for his expenditure. The discriminating commend him, and I shall repeat what men say, he cultivates a mind and eloquence beyond his years, and in boldness he is a long-winged eagle among other birds. In competition he has the strength of a tower, in the muse's company he takes wing, through his dear mother, and he has proved himself a skilled charioteer. He has walked with boldness along every road which could bring his people renown, and now a god has generously brought his power to fruition. And so in time to come, you blessed children of Cronus, allow him to possess an equal eminence in word and counsel, that no stormy blasts of autumn winds may disrupt his life to come. In truth, the mighty mind of Zeus governs the destiny of men he loves, I pray that he may award this prize to Battus race at Olympia. Pythian 6 For Xenocrates of Acragas, winner of the chariot race listen, for again we plough the field of glancing-eyed Aphrodite, or of the graces, as we make our way to the temple which is the navel stone of the deep roaring earth, we're in preparation for the wealthy amenity, for Acragas on its river, and indeed for Xenocrates, a Pythian victor's treasure house of hymns has been erected in the valley of Apollo, rich in gold, which neither winter storm, summoned from loud roaring clouds like the onslaught of a pitiless army, nor wind will carry away into the hidden places of the sea, battered by the irresistible shingle, but in a pure light its frontage shall bring to your father, Thrasybulus, to be shared by your family, the news of a chariot victory celebrated in the words of men and one in the dales of Cresa. In truth, by keeping it at your right hand, you maintain the force of the principle which they say Philera's son once in the mountains commended to the mighty son of Peleus. Left alone in his care, above all gods to revere the son of Cronus, the deep-voiced lord of thunder and lightning, and never to withhold the same honor from his parents during their destined span of life. In former times, too, this thought was held by mighty Antilochus, who stood firm against murderous Memnon, the Ethiopian's captain, and died to save his father, for Nestor's chariot was encumbered when his horse was wounded by Paris' arrows. He was shaking his mighty spear, 
and the old Messenian's mind was confused, he called out to his son, nor were his words flung idly to the ground. That godlike man stood firm just where he was, and bought his father's deliverance with his death, and was considered by young men of that former generation because of this stupendous deed to be unsurpassed in dutiful behavior towards his parents. These things belong to the past, but among men of today Thrasybulus comes nearest to the pattern of filial devotion, and runs his uncle close in every kind of splendid display. He is wise in handling his wealth, and does not cull the flower of youth with injustice or insolent excess, but chooses wisdom in the secret garden of the Pyrian muses. It is to you, Earthshaker, lord of the racing of horses, that he attaches himself, and his thoughts delight you greatly, and among his companions in the symposium his sweet spirit exceeds the honeycombed labor of bees. Pythian 7. For Megacles of Athens, winner of the chariot race Athens, that great city, is the finest prelude to lay down as a foundation for songs in praise of a chariot victory won by the powerful Alcmeonide. Could you make your home in a land whose name enjoys a more glorious fame in Hellas? No, for the tale of Erechtheus citizens is known in every city, they who have made your temple at Holy Pytho, Apollo, a marvelous sight. Five victories at the Isthmus drive me on, and one glorious triumph at Zeus' Olympian festival, and two at Syra, Megacles, won by your clan and its ancestors. I am pleased at your recent good fortune, but grieve that success is repaid with envy. Yet this, they say, is how the world goes, happiness that thrives and stays with a man brings with it now good things, now bad. Pythian 8. For Aristomenes of Aegina, winner in the wrestling benevolent concord, daughter of justice, who makes cities great, holder of the paramount keys of counsel and war, accept this him in honor of Aristomenes, victor at Pythia. For you know how to practice gentleness, and how to receive it, unerringly choosing the right moment for each. But when a man drives pitiless anger into his heart you roughly confront your enemy's strength, and sweep his insolent violence into the bilges. Not even Porphyrian was aware of your nature when he presumptuously provoked you. Gain is most prized when one has it from the house of a willing donor, but violence overthrows a man in the end however loud his boasts. Typho's the hundred-headed Cilician could not escape this fate, nor indeed could the king of the giants, but they were beaten down by the thunderbolt and Apollo's arrows, who with kind intent welcomed Zenars's son home from Syrah, crowned with Parnassian wreaths and Dorian victory rebel. Nor did this just island city fall far from the graces, sharing as it does in the glorious achievements of the Eacids. From the beginning it has enjoyed matchless fame, for it is celebrated in song for its nurture of heroes, preeminent in many victorious games and in the melee of battles, and moreover is renowned for its citizens. But I have no leisure to commit a full and lengthy account to the lyre and to the soft-toned voice, for that way an irksome surfeit may intervene. Rather let what lies at my feet, the urgent debt I owe you, my boy, your latest glorious success, take wings by means of my art. For in following the trail of your mother's brothers as a wrestler you do not shame Theognetus at Olympia, or brawny Clytomachus, victor at the Isthmus, but in glorifying the family of my Dility you bear out the words which Eccles' son once spoke in riddles as he saw the sons at seven-gated Thebes standing fast with their spears, when the Epigoni had come from Argos on their second expedition. As they fought he spoke, the Fathers' noble spirit is plain to see, fixed by nature in their sons, I can clearly make out the speckled snake on Alcman's flashing shield as he brandishes it in the forefront by Cadmus' gates. And he who suffered in a former disaster, the hero Adrastus, now encounters news of a better omen, though in his own home his fortune will be reversed, for alone of the Danan army he will gather up his dead son's bones. But by the will of the gods, will return to the wide streets of Abbas with his company unharmed. So spoke Amphiaros, and I too am glad to throw garlands at Alcman and to rain hymns upon him, because he is my neighbor and guardian of my wealth, and came to meet me on my way to the navel stone of the earth, celebrated in song, and made use of his prophetic hereditary skills. And you, far shooter, who rule over your famous temple in the dales of Pytho where all are welcomed, it was there you granted him the greatest source of joy, and formerly at his home, at your joint festival, you brought him the longed-for gift of the pentathlon. Lord, I pray that you will with favorable mind and in a spirit of amity look upon every step of my journey. Next to the sweetly singing revel band Justice has taken her stand, I ask, Xenarsis, that the gods' favor may be without envy towards your family's fortunes.
For if someone achieves great things without long toil he seems to many to be a wise man among fools, equipping his life with judicious strategies. But these things do not lie with men, it is God who provides. Now raising one man high, now thrusting another down under his hands, he goes down into the arena with an even hand. Aristomenes, you won the prize at Megara and in Marathon's Valley, and were three times victorious by your exertions at Hera's local games. On four bodies you sprang from above with hurt in mind, for them no homeward way was decreed at the Pythia happy as yours, nor did welcome laughter give rise to encompassing joy when they returned to their mothers, but shunning their enemies they slink home down alleyways, not by failure. But the man to whom fate has granted some recent success flies up in great splendor on the wings of deeds of manly prowess, and his concerns are with more than riches. Men's pleasure swells in a brief space of time, and likewise falls to the ground, shaken by an adverse judgment. Creatures of a day. What is man? What is he not? He is the dream of a shadow, yet when Zeus sent brightness comes a brilliant light shines upon mankind and their life is serene. Aegina, dear mother, protect this city on its freeborn voyage, aided by Zeus, King Aeacus, Peleus, noble Telamon sand Achilles. Pythia 9. For Telesocrates of Cyrene, winner of the race in armor I proclaim, with the help of the deep-girdled graces, a victory of Telesocrates in the bronze shield race at Pytho, I wish to shout aloud his good fortune, and how he has crowned horse-driving Cyrene whom the flowing-haired son of Leto once carried off from Pelion's echoing windy valleys and bore the virgin huntress away in a golden chariot to a place where he made her mistress of a land teeming with flocks and superabundant in fruits, to live in the beautiful and prosperous third root of the mainland. Silver-footed Aphrodite lightly touched his god-built chariot with her hand and welcomed her Delian guest, and over the pleasures of their marriage bed she cast beguiling modesty, linking in close harmonious union the god and the daughter of white ruling Hypsius, who at that time was king of the haughty Lapiths, a hero in the second generation from Oceanus, the Naiad Creusa, daughter of Earth, had given him birth in Pindus' famous dales, after enjoying the pleasure of Peneus' bed. He raised his daughter, fair-armed Cyrene, but she had no interest in walking to and fro before the loom, or in the delights of feasts at home with girl companions but with bronze spears and sword she fought and killed wild beasts, and indeed brought great peace and security to her father's cattle, spending but a short time with her sweet bedfellow, sleep, that would drop on her eyelids just before dawn. Once the far-shooter Apollo, lord of the wide quiver, found her struggling alone, unarmed, with a huge lion. Quickly he summoned Chiron from his home, and said, Son of Philera, leave your holy cave, and wonder at this woman's spirit and mighty power, See how she conducts her fight with unfaltering resolution, a girl with a heart that rises above hardship and a spirit that is untouched by storms of fear. What man fathered her? From what stock has she been torn away, living in these shadowy mountains' hidden places, and making trial of her boundless strength? Is it permitted to lay my illustrious hand on her and reap the honey-sweet flower of her bed? The mighty centaur smiled subduedly, with an indulgent lift of his brow and at once spoke and gave him his advice, secret are the keys to divine acts of love which are held by wise persuasion, Phoebus, and men and gods alike hold back from taking the first open step towards the joys of sweet Congress. And so it is with you, it is not lawful for you to touch on truth, but your tender feelings have led you astray, so that you dissemble in your words. Do you ask this girl's ancestry, Lord, you who know the ordained end of everything and all the paths that lead thereto? How many leaves the earth sends forth in spring, how many grains of sand and sea and river are churned up by blasts of waves and winds, what will come to pass, and whence it will come, all this you know well. But if I must really pit myself against a wise God, I shall speak. It is as this girl's husband that you have come to this dale, and you are destined to carry her over the sea to Zeus' magnificent garden, where you will make her ruler of a city, after assembling an island people on a hill in a plain. Even now queenly Libya of the broad meadows is ready to welcome your glorious bride with gladness in her golden palace, where she will without delay bestow on her a portion of land to possess by right, with its full share of all kinds of fruits, and not unknown to wild beasts. There she will bear a son, whom renowned Hermes will take from his dear mother and carry off to earth, and to the seasons on their fine thrones. 
They will marvel at the child on their knees and drip nectar and ambrosia onto his lips and make him immortal, a Zeus or a holy Apollo, a joy to men who revere him, a close companion of their flocks, Agrius and Nomius will be his name, though others will call him Aristeus. So he spoke and urged him to attain the sweet consummation of marriage. When the gods are in haste fulfillment is swift and ways are short, that same day saw the matter accomplished, and they were united in the rich golden chamber of Libya. Where now she presides over a beautiful city, famous in the games. And now, now its sacred Pytho the son of Carniatus has linked her with flourishing good fortune, his victory there has published Cyrene's fame, and she will gladly welcome him to her land of beautiful women, for he brings coveted glory back from Delphi. Great prowess always brings forth many words, but when the list is long discriminating people prefer to hear a few themes amplified, appropriateness in all things equally is the best. Long ago seven-gated Thebes knew that Iolaus too endorsed this dictum, when he had struck off Eurystheus' head with his sword's edge they buried him in the earth below in the tomb where his grandfather lay, Amphitryon the charioteer, who was the guest friend of the sown men after he had left home for the streets of the Cadmines, home of white horses. Wise Alcmene lay with him and with Zeus, and in a single labor bore mighty twin sons, victorious in battle. Dull is the man whose speech cannot encompass Heracles, or who is forever unmindful of the waters of Durst which fed both him and Ithacles. For them I shall sing this praise because of the good fortune I enjoyed in answer to my prayer. May the pure light of the loud-voiced graces not desert me, for at both Aegina and, yes, three times on the hill of Nisus he, I say, has glorified this city by his efforts evading impotent silence. So let no citizen, friend or foe, conceal this labor for the common good, and so treat with contempt that saying of the old man of the sea, give even to your enemy unfeigned and due praise, if he has done well. Telesocrates, when they saw you win so often at palace annual festival, and at Olympian games, and at those of deep-bosomed earth, and in every contest in your own country, each girl would wish in silence that it was you who were her dearest husband or son. As for me, while I may quench the thirst for songs, someone demands payment of a debt, that I should call up again the ancient fame of his ancestors, as they were when they came to the city of Iresa for the sake of a Libyan woman, as suitors for the far-famed, fair-haired daughter of Antaeus, who many of her noble kinsmen sought, and many strangers too, for her beauty was marvelous and they wished to cull the blossoming fruit of her gold-crowned youth. But her father was planning a more splendid marriage for his daughter. He had heard how once at Argos Danaeus had found a way to contrive the speediest of weddings for his forty-eight unwed girls, before midday. Without delay he placed the whole group at the course's end, and ordered them to decide by a foot race which girl each of the heroes who had come to woo them should win. In just this way did the Libyan offer his daughter, matching her to a bridegroom. He dressed her in finery and set her by the finishing line as the ultimate prize, and proclaimed to all that the man who ran in first and touched her robe should be the one to carry her away. Then Alexidemus, running clear in the swift race, took the noble girl by the hand and led her through the mass of nomad horsemen. Many were the leaves and crowns they rained on him, and many the winged victory wreaths he had won before. Pythian 10 for Hippocleus of Thessaly, winner of the boys' long sprint race happy is Lacedaemon, blessed is Thessaly. Their kings both descend from one father, Heracles, supreme in battle. Why do I make this assertion? Do I miss the mark? No, because Pytho and Polina and the sons of Aelius command me, wishing to bring to Hippocleus the fine voices of men singing in praise, for he tastes success in the games, and Parnassus Vale has declared him to the surrounding people to be supreme among boys who ran the double race. Apollo, sweet is the end for men, and the beginning brings success when a god speeds it on. It must be by your devising that Hippocleus has succeeded in this, but it is also by his inborn qualities that he has walked in the footsteps of his father, who was twice a winner at Olympia in the armor of Ares that withstands the jolts of war, and Frisias was victorious too in the contest in the deep meadow below Cirrus Crags. May destiny continue to accompany them in the days to come, and cause their proud wealth to bloom. Now they have been allotted no small share in the good things of Hellas may they meet no envious change of fortune from the gods. The heart of a god may be untouched by pain, 
But that man is happy and fit to be hymned by poets in song who is victorious by the excellence of his hands or feet, and who wins the greatest prizes through daring and strength, and in his lifetime has seen his young son duly gain a Pythian crown. He will never climb the brazen heaven, but of all the glories which our mortal race may reach his voyage takes him to the farthest region. But neither on foot nor by sea could you discover the fabulous way to the gathering of the Hyperboreans. Perseus, leader of men, once entered their houses and feasted with them, after he had come upon them as they were sacrificing splendid hecatombs of asses to the god, Apollo always takes special delight in their feasts and worship and laughs to see the beast's upright arrogance. Nor is the muse a stranger to their customs, everywhere maidens whirl in the dance to the loud lyre and the pipe's strident voice. At their merry feasts they bind golden laurel in their hair, disease has no place among that holy people, nor ruinous old age, but they live without toil or battle, avoiding Nemesis' severe judgment. To the company of these blessed men Danae's son once came, guided by Athena, his heart exhaled boldness, and he killed the gorgon and carried off her head adorned with snaky hair and brought to the island people a stony death. To me, no marvel ever seems beyond belief, if the gods accomplish it. Ease the oar, quickly drop the anchor from the prow and drive it into the ground to save us from the rocky reef, for the best hymns of praise flit like bees from one theme to another. I trust that when the people of Ephra pour forth my sweet music beside the Peneus, I shall with my songs make Hippopolis even more admired for his crowns by both peers and elders, and an object of desire for young unmarried girls. Truly, desires for different things scratch at men's minds. As for a man's ambitions, he would achieve them if he should take the heart's desire that lies before him, but there is no means of telling what another year may bring. I place my confidence in Thorax's kindly hospitality, who has busied himself on my behalf, and has yoked this four-horse chariot of the Pyrian Muses, as friend to friend and cheerful guide to guide. Testing on a touchstone proves gold, and the same goes for an upright mind. We shall also praise his noble brothers, because they extol and glorify the state of the Thessalians. The piloting of cities lies in good men's hands, it is their valued inheritance. Pythian 11. For Thrasydeus of Thebes, winner of the boys' short sprint race daughters of Cadmus, Semele, neighbor of Olympian goddesses, and Eno Leucothea, sharing a home with the Cenariids, come with the nobly born mother of Heracles into Melia's presence in the sanctuary of golden tripods, the treasury which Loxias honored above all others and named the Asmenian, the truth-speaking seat of prophets, their daughters of Harmonia, he now summons a local company of heroines, inhabitants of that land, to assemble together, so that at nightfall you may sing aloud of holy Themis and of Pytho and the straight-judging navel of the earth, for the sake of seven-gated Thebes and the contest at Syra, where Thrasydeus distinguished his ancestral hearth by casting on it a third crown as victor in the rich plufflands of Pylades. Guest friend of Laconian Orestes, who, after his father's murder, was secretly saved from the violent hands and pain-laden treachery of Clytemestra by his nurse Arsino. At the time when with the grey bronze that pitiless woman dispatched Cassandra, daughter of Dardanian Priam, to Acheron's shadowy shore, accompanied by the spirit of Agamemnon. Was it the ritual killing of Iphigenia at Euripus, far from her homeland, that stung her to summon the anger leading to this dreadful act? Or was she enslaved by another's bed, seduced by nocturnal couplings, a most abominable crime in young wives, and one impossible to hide because of other people's tongues, for fellow citizens are given to spreading scandal? Prosperity contains in it an equal measure of envy while the grumbling of those who live a lowly life goes unheard. The hero son of Atreus was himself killed when he returned at last to famous Amicle, and he also caused the death of the maiden prophetess, after he had burnt the Trojans' palaces, for the sake of Helen, and had put an end to their sumptuous living. His young son escaped to the old man Strophius, a guest friend who lived at the foot of Parnassus, but in time, with the help of Ares, he killed his mother and struck Aegisthus down in a pool of blood. My friends, though I followed a straight path at first I have become bewildered at the place where the road forks, or did some wind blow me off my course, like a boat at sea? Muse, it is your task, since you have agreed to hire out your voice for silver, to shift it this way and that, either to his father Pythonicus now, or to Thrasydeus, since their happiness and glory are blazing forth.
In time past not only were they victors with their chariots, and at Olympia captured swift brightness with their horses in the famous games, but now at Pytho going down into the naked stadion race they have confounded all Hellas by their speed. May I desire good things from the gods, striving only for what is within reach at my time of life. In the city's affairs I find that the middle course brings by far the most thriving prosperity, and I condemn the state of a tyrant. I st strive for successes that serve the common good, for thus the envious are kept at bay. But if a man has attained the heights, conducting himself in peace and avoiding terrible arrogance, he may reach a better destination in dark death because he has left to his beloved descendants the best of all possessions, the fame of a good reputation. This it is which marks out Iola's son of Ithacles as a theme for hymns, and powerful Castor, and you, Lord Polydus's, sons of gods, living one day in your homes in Therapn, and the next on Olympus. Pythian 12. For Midas of Acragas, winner in the pipe playing most beautiful and radiant of mortal cities, home of Persephone, you I pray to, who make your home on a strongly built hill above the banks of Acragas, nurse of sheep, be gracious, O queen, and with the favor of gods and men accept both this crown won at Pytho by honored Midas, and the man himself, who overcame all Hellas in the art once invented by Pallas Athena, when she wove music from the savage Gorgon's deadly dirge, which she heard pouring forth from the unapproachable snaky heads of the maidens in their painful struggle, at the time when Perseus with an exultant cry carried off one of the three sisters, bringing death to the island of Seraphis and its people. He had indeed sapped the strength of Forcus' outlandish offspring and, by despoiling fair-cheeked Medusa of her head, had made Polydectes regret his feast. And the binding enslavement of his mother, forced into his bed, he was Danae's son, conceived, as our tale goes, from a liquid stream of gold. But when the virgin goddess had saved her favorite from these trials she devised the complex music of the pipes, to imitate with instruments the piercing lament which was wrung from Uriel's grinding jaws. A goddess invented it, but gave her invention to mortals to possess, and called it the melody of many heads. Now it famously woos men to congregate at the games, as often as it passes through thin-beaten bronze and the reeds, trusty witnesses of the dancers, that grow in Cephas's precinct beside the city of the graces of beautiful dancing places. If there is any happiness among men, it does not come without exertion. Perhaps a god will bring it about today, for we cannot escape what is fated, but there will come a time which will strike a man unawares, and give him one thing when he does not expect it, and hold another back. Nemeans Nemean 1. For Chromius of Etna, winner of the chariot race Ortigia, resting place of Alpheus, offshoot of famous Syracuse, couch of Artemis the sister of Delos, from you a hymn of sweet words rises up to frame great praise for storm-footed horses in honor of Zeus of Etna. The chariot of Chromius and Nemea prompt me to yoke a song of praise to his victorious exploits. The foundations were laid by the gods through this man's divinely given talents, but it is success that marks the peak of supreme glory, and the muse loves to commemorate great contests. So scatter brilliance over the island which Zeus lord of Olympus gave to Persephone, and, his hair falling forward with his nod, promised that he would raise up fertile Sicily with its high and prosperous cities to be preeminent on the plentiful earth. And Cronus' son granted her a horseman people in love with bronze-armored war, and no stranger to the golden leaves of Olympic olive. I have grasped the occasion to treat of many themes and have not marred them with falsehoods. I stand singing of noble deeds at the outer gates of a hospitable man, where an acceptable feast has been prepared for me, and this house is not unacquainted with frequent guests from abroad. It has fallen to him to use good men against disparagers as water against smoke. Different men have different skills, one ought to walk in straight ways and in competition use inborn abilities. For strength attains its end through action and understanding through the advice of those who have the natural talent to foresee the future. Son of Hagasidimus, it is in your nature to make use of both. I do not long to possess great wealth, hidden away in a palace, but to enjoy what I have and to be well regarded for being of service to my friends, for the hopes of much laboring men are all alike. And when, for my part, I speak of great pinnacles of achievement, I am glad to hold close to the example of Heracles, calling up the ancient tale, how, when Zeus' son had emerged from his mother's womb with his twin brother into the amazing brilliance of day, escaping her birth pangs, 
Golden Throne Hera was not unaware of him as he lay there in yellow swaddling clothes. The Queen of the Gods, furious in her heart, forthwith dispatched snakes, and they made straight through the open doors for the wide inner part of his chamber, impatient to envelop the infants in their darting jaws. But Heracles raised his head upright and set about his first battle, seizing the two snakes by the throat in his two irresistible hands, strangling them. Time passed and forced the breath from their dreadful bodies. Unendurable fear struck the women who attended Alcmene's bed, for she had leapt naked to her feet from her couch, and yet was trying to drive off the monster's assault. Quickly the Cadmian chieftains ran up in a body with bronze weapons, and Amphitryon too arrived, transfixed with piercing pain, swinging his unsheathed sword in his hand, for anguish at home weighs heavily on all alike, while the heart is easily untroubled by another's distress. He stood there in amazement, at once agonizing and full of joy, as he saw the singular spirit and power of his son, for the immortal gods had contradicted the messenger's report. He summoned Tiresias the trustworthy seer who lived nearby, the eminent prophet of highest Zeus, who made known to him, and to all the people what fortunes Heracles would meet, how many beasts he would kill on land, and how many at sea, all ignorant of justice. Further, he said that he would cut down in a most horrible doom any man who walked in the crooked way of excess, for he foretold that when the gods would fight with the giants on the plain of Phlegra, their bright hair would be soiled with earth under a shower of his arrows, but that he himself in uninterrupted peace for all time would receive as his special portion relief from his labors in a blessed palace, he would take Hebe as his fruitful wife, and hold his wedding feast at the side of Zeus Cronus' son, and sound the praises of his revered rule. Nemean too. For Timodemus of Acarni, winner in the Pancration, even as the sons of Homer, singers of stitched verses, begin for the most part with a prelude to Zeus, so has this man laid a first foundation of victory in the sacred games at the much hymned grove of Nemean Zeus. And if indeed his life has guided him unerringly on the road of his ancestors and given him as a glory to great Athens, it must surely be that the son of Timonus will often pluck the finest flower of prizes at the Isthmian games, and will also be victorious at the Pythian, it is likely that Orion will closely follow the mountain-born Pleiades. And indeed Salamis is surely able to nurture a fighting man. Ajax at Troy had the better of Hector, and in the Pancration you, Timodemus, are exalted by your strength and perseverance. Acarni has long been famous for its noble men, and in all matters of the games the Timodemity are acknowledged as supreme. For times they have carried off the prize at the games under high-ruling Parnassus, and in the valleys of excellent Pelops have already donned eight crowns at the hands of the men of Corinth, seven at Nemea, in the games of Zeus, and at home victories beyond number. Citizens, include Zeus in your revel for Timodemus' brilliant homecoming, and lead off with a voice of sweet melody. Nemean 3. For Aristoclides of Aegina, winner in the Pancration Lady Muse, my mother, I pray you, come in this sacred Nemean month to the hospitable Dorian island of Aegina, for young men, artificers of honey-voiced revels, impatient for your voice, await you by Asipus waters. Each deed thirsts after something different but victory in the game's love song above all, which is the deftest attendant of garlanded success. Grant me, through my craft, an abundance of it. You are Zeus' daughter, begin a hymn acceptable to the lord of the many-clouded sky, and I shall pass it on to these voices and to the lyre. It will be a pleasing labor to adorn this land, where the Myrmidons lived in former times, whose famous meeting place Aristoclides has not sullied, thanks to your favor, by acts of ignominy, by growing soft in the Pancration strenuous tournament. He has earned in his triumph a healing remedy against the wearying blows endured on Nemea's low-lying plain. If the son of Aristophanes, handsome as he is and a doer of deeds which match his beauty, has reached the ultimate in feats of manhood, it is yet no e easy matter to press on to the unsailed sea beyond the pillars of Heracles, which the hero god set as conspicuous witnesses to the furthest limit of his seafaring. He overcame monstrous creatures in the sea, and alone explored channels through the shallows, by which he reached the goal that returned him home, and he mapped out the land. My heart, to what foreign cape do you deflect my course? It is to Aeacus and his family that I order you to carry the muse. The essence of justice keeps to this maxim, praise what is noble. It is not best for a man to give in to yearnings for exotic themes, seek nearer home, for you have been assigned fitting matter to make into a sweet song of praise. 
King Peleus delighted in his prowess in time past, when he had cut his enormous spear, he who captured Iolcus alone, without an army, and with a great struggle carried off the sea nymph Thetis. Mighty Telamon stood beside Iolaus and crushed Laomedon. And with him once went after the powerful Amazons of the bronze bows, and never did man's subduing fear hold back the edge of his resolution. It is by inborn distinction that a man gains authority, while he who has only been taught is a man of shadows, he veers hither and thither, and never enters the arena with a confident step, trying out thousands of exploits in his feudal mind. But fair-haired Achilles, when still a child in Philera's house, did great deeds in play, poising his short iron spear in his hands, swift as the winds, he would often spread carnage while battling with wild lions and would slaughter boars. He would bring their gasping bodies to the centaur, Cronus' son, first when he was six years old, and then forever after. Artemis was amazed, and intrepid Athene too, at his killing of deer without dogs and cunning nets, for he ran them down on foot. I have the tale from men of former times that deeply wise Chiron raised Jason in his stone habitation, and after him Asclepius, whom he taught the soft-handed craft of medicine. Later he arranged the marriage of Nereus' beautiful daughter, and reared her mighty offspring, building his spirit up in all appropriate ways. So that when he was driven by gusting sea winds to fight before Troy, he would be able to withstand the spear-clattering battle cry of Lycians and Phrygians and Dardanians. And, and when he came to grips with the spear-bearing Ethiopians, would set the purpose firmly in his heart that their king Memnon, Helena's fiery cousin, should not return home again. From his deeds beamed steadily the far-shining light of Aeacus' clan, for yours is the blood, Zeus, and yours the games which my am strikes upon, chanting this land's delight in the voices of its young men. Victorious Aristoclides merits the loud song, for he has tied this island to splendid renown, and Apollo's solemn Thierian with glorious ambition. It is in the trial that a man shows clearly how he will emerge superior, as a boy among boys, as a man among men, and thirdly among the old, thus do we mortal men live each portion of life. There are moreover four virtues that our human existence drives us towards, and instructs us to consider what lies before us. In these you are not deficient, good health, my friend. I send you this honey blended with white milk, as you see, crowned with stirred dew, a draught of song attended by the breath of Aeolian pipes, late though it is. The eagle is swift among birds, and swooping from afar seizes in its claws its blood-spattered prey, while chattering jackdaws keep to the lower air. But for you now, through the favor of fair throne Cleo, and by virtue of your spirit, avid for victory, the light shines out from Nemea and Epidorus and Megara. Nemean 4. For Timasarchus of Aegina, winner in the wrestling joy is the best healer after the judgment of the strenuous contest, and songs, two poetic daughters of the muses, soothe the victor with their touch. Nor does warm water ease his limbs as much as praise, partner of the lyre. Words live longer than deeds, words which the tongue, with the grace's favor, draws from the mind's depths. May I compose such words as the revel prologue to my hymn, for Cronus' son Zeus, for Nemea, for Timasarchus' wrestling skill, and may they be welcomed in the strongly built house of the Eacids this guiding light of justice which welcomes every stranger. If your father Timocritus were still warmed by the fierce sun he would often have accompanied this song, playing a complex melody on the lyre. Loudly celebrating the victory of his son who has brought back a string of crowns from Cleone's games and from illustrious shining Athens, and because it's seven-gated Thebes, beside Amphitryon's splendid tomb. The Cadmians gladly heaped flowers on him, out of regard for Regina. For, coming to his host's city as a friend to friends, he looked across at the rich court of Heracles, with whom mighty Telamon once devastated Troy and the Meropes and the terrible warrior Alcyonius, but not before he wrecked twelve four-horse chariots with a rock, killing the horse-trainer heroes riding in them, two in each. The inexperienced in warfare will clearly not understand this tale, those who achieve must expect to suffer as well. But custom and the hurrying hours preclude a lengthy account, and my heart is drawn as if by the Rhinex spell to touch on the festival of the new moon. And yet, though the deep salt sea grips you by the waist, hold out against its scheming, we shall enter the contest in full daylight, far stronger than our adversaries, while another man, with envy in his eyes, pours out his empty opinions in darkness, and they fall to the ground.
As for me, whatever talents Lord Destiny has granted me, I know that advancing time will surely bring them to fulfillment. We then this song to its end, and without delay, sweet lyre, in the Lydian mode, one loved by Enoni in Cyprus, where Tusser son of Telamon rules, far from home, while Ajax holds Salamis, his ancestral land, and Achilles his bright island in the Euxine Sea. Thetis rules in Thia, and Neoptolemus in the continuous mainland, where lofty cattle grazing ridges slope down from Dodona to the Ionian Sea. At Pelion's foot Peleus fell upon Iolcus with warlike hand and handed it over in slavery to the Haemones, having suffered from the crooked wiles of Hippolyta, wife of Acastus. Peleus' son had tried to kill him in ambush with the sword of Daedalus, but he was saved by Chiron, and so fulfilled the fate destined for him by Zeus, he balked the all-conquering fire, the knife-edged claws and terrible teeth of boldly plotting lions, and married a high-throne Nereid. He saw the splendid circle of seats where the kings of heaven and earth sat, and revealed their gifts, and the power which would come to his race. But it is not permitted to pass to the west of Gadira, set your ship's sails back to Europe's mainland, for I cannot run through the whole tale of Aeacus' offspring. My contract is with the Theandridae, and I have come here to be a prompt herald of limb-building contests at Olympia, at the Isthmus, and at Nemea. After competing there they always return home with a glorious harvest of crowns, where, Timosarchus, we hear that your family is an adherent of victory songs. If indeed you command me to set up a pillar, whiter than Parian marble, to your uncle Calicles, as refined gold reveals all its brilliance, so a hymn to a man's brave deeds puts his fortune on a level with kings. May he, in his home by Acheron, hear my voice singing of the place where, at the deep rumbling Triton Holders games, he was crowned with Corinthian wild celery, he of whom, my boy, your aged grandfather Euphanes once gladly sang. Every generation is different, and each man expects to claim as exceptional what he himself has witnessed. So a poet might emulate Milesias as he twisted in the contest, weaving his phrases, not to be thrown in the argument's grapple, treating the noble with gentle attention, but for the ill will the harsh opponent in the next round. Nemi in 5. For Pythias of Aegina, winner in the youth's pancration I am no sculptor, to create images which stand motionless on their base. No, sweet song, you must go forth from Aegina on every ship and merchantman, carrying the news that Lampon's powerful son Pythias has won the pancration crown at Nemea, his cheeks do not yet show late summer, mother of the soft grape bloom, but he has brought honor to the Eacids, warrior heroes born of Cronus and Zeus with the golden Nereids, and to his mother city, a land welcoming to strangers, which once endies famous sons and mighty lord Phocus, he whom divine Samothea bore on the seashore, standing beside the altar of Father Hellenius and holding their hands wide up to the sky prayed might be celebrated for its ships and as a home of brave men. I shrink from telling of their grave deed, one ventured without justice, how indeed they left the famous island and what destiny drove these mighty men away from Enoni. Here I shall stop, not every truth is the better for showing its real face, and silence is often the wisest course for a man to devise. But if, if it is wealth or strength of hands or iron war that is to be praised, then let someone dig me a wide jumping pit from this place, for I have a nimble spring in my knees, and eagles may soar beyond the sea. For these people too the muses' beautiful chorus sang on Pelion, and among them Apollo swept the seven-tongued lyre with a golden plectrum, and led them in diverse melodies. They began with Zeus and first sang a hymn for revered Thetis and for Peleus, telling how the alluring Hippolyta, Cretheus' child, desired to shackle him by guile, having persuaded her husband, master of the magnets, by artful scheming to be her accomplice, she fabricated a false, contrived story that he was attempting to enjoy her as his wife in a castus marriage bed. But the opposite was the case, many times she had artfully begged him with all her heart, but her vehement words only provoked his anger, and he swiftly rebuffed the wife, fearing the rage of the father. Patron of guests, and Zeus, cloud-summoning king of the immortals, understood him well from heaven and promised he would soon have a sea nymph, a nereid of the golden distaff, to be his bride. After he had won over her suitor Poseidon, who often comes from Egi to the glorious Dorian Isthmus, where joyful companies welcome the god with the cry of the pipe, and strive with each other in their limbs' confident strength. Inborn destiny determines the outcome of every deed. 
Twice, euthamines, you came from Aegina, and falling into victory's arms were favored with intricate hymns, and even now, Pythias, your mother's brother speeds behind you and exalts the family he shares with that man. Nemia, and the month that Apollo loves, is his true support, he overcame his peers who came to meet him, both at his home and in the lovely valleys of Nysus Hill. I rejoice that the whole city competes for honorable prizes. Know that it was truly through the good fortune of Menander's aid that you won a sweet recompense for your labors. It is just that a builder of athletes should hail from Athens, but if it is of Themistus you have come to sing, hesitate no longer, give voice, unfurl your sails at the highest yard, and declare him boxer and pancratiast, doubly distinguished by victory at Epidaurus. Bring crowns of leaves and flowers to Aeacus' temple portico, in the company of the fair-haired graces. Nemean 6. For Alcimedes of Aegina, winner in the boys wrestling there is one race of men, and one of gods, though from one mother we both draw our breath. A division of power keeps us entirely separate, the one is nothing, the other has an eternal home in the secure brazen heaven. Even so, we resemble the immortals in some respects, in greatness of mind or of stature, though we do not know by day or night what finishing line destiny has marked out for us to run towards. And now Alcimedes gives us the proof to see how inborn talents resemble crop-yielding fields, which by turns yield men an abundant livelihood from the ground and then again lie fallow and so gain strength. Indeed, there has come from the lovely games at Nemea a competitor who has followed this destiny fixed by Zeus and now shows himself to be no portionless hunter at wrestling. But setting his feet in the kindred tracks of his grandfather Praxidamas, for he was a victor at Olympia, the first to bring garlands back from the Alpheus to the clan of Aeacus. Five, five times crowned at the Isthmus and three times at Nemea, he rescued Socleides from obscurity so that he became the greatest of the sons of Hygasimachus, for he had three prize-winning sons, who tasted hardship and reached the peak of excellence. Helped by the gods, their boxer's craft has shown us that no other house is holder of more crowns, one at the very center of Hellas. I hope in this bold boast to hit the mark full on, shooting like an archer from my bow. Come, muse, guide a glorious wind of poetry onto this house, for when men die it is songs and stories that recall their fine deeds, in these the Bassidy, a family famed of old, are not deficient for their ships carry a cargo of their own praise, and by virtue of their noble achievements they can give the Pyrians Pluffman much matter for hymns. So indeed one of the same bloodline, Callias, once at Holy Pytho bound his fists with thongs, and was victorious, pleasing the offspring of Leto of the Golden Distaff. And in the evening by Castalia shone like a flame in the Graces' clamorous company, and the bridge of the tireless sea honored Creontidas in Poseidon's precinct at the biennial bull-slaying festival held by the people who live round about. And once the lion's herb covered his victor's brow underneath the ancient shady mountains of Phlius. Broader the approach roads from every direction for poets to celebrate this famous island, for by the revelation of their great achievements the Eacids have granted it an outstanding destiny, and their name wings far and wide over land and sea. It leapt even to the Ethiopians when Memnon failed to return, when Achilles stepped from his chariot to the ground and fell upon them, a heavy opponent, on the day he slaughtered the shining dawn's sun at the point of his furious spear. Poets of former times have discovered this high road, and I myself follow them, intent on my theme. But it is always the wave which rolls over the ship's rigging, they say, that especially perturbs a man's heart. I shoulder a double burden on my willing back and come as a herald to declare that this is the 25th success brought home from the games that men call sacred which you, Alcimedes, have conferred on your famous clan, though the lot that was drawn deprived you, my boy, and Polytimidas of two Olympian reeds by the precinct of Cronus' son. To a dolphin swift through the salt sea, I would liken Milesia's, a charioteer of skill and strength. Nemean 7. For so genes of Aegina, winner in the boys' pentathlon Elythia, enthroned beside the deep pondering muses, daughter of powerful Hera, bringer to birth of children, hear me, without you we cannot look upon the light or the dark night, nor receive our portion of your sister, shining-limbed Hebe. Yet we do not all draw breath with equal chances, different things hold each man back, yoked to destiny. But with your help so genes Thierian son is son to fame, renowned for his prowess among pentathletes. His home is the song-loving city of the spear-clashing Eacids, 
and they are well pleased to honor a spirit tested in competition. If a man succeeds in any enterprise, he throws a honeyed theme into the muses' waters, for when they lack him's great feats of courage live in deep darkness. We know of one way only to mirror fine deeds, if, by the help of shining cap Nemosyne, some recompense for a man's toil is found in splendid poetic song. Wise men have learnt of the wind that comes on the third day, and they are not corrupted by gain, rich and poor alike must make their way to the tomb of death. Odysseus' fame, I believe, is greater than his true experience because of Homer's sweet poetry, for there is a grandeur in his lies and soaring artifice, and his poetic skill misleads and deceives us with its stories. The mass of mankind is blind in heart, if they had been able to discern the truth, mighty Ajax would not have driven his polished sword into his breast, angered over the award of arms, Ajax, Achilles apart, the strongest in battle of those whom the escorting winds of straight-blowing Zephyrus conveyed in swift ships to the city of Ilus to recover the wife of fair-haired Menelaus. But the surge of Hades comes to all alike, and falls on men whether they expect it or not. Honor attends those whose story is enriched by a god after death, as a helper he came to the great navel of broad-bosomed earth. In Pytho's earth lies Neoptolemus, when he had sacked Priam's city, where the Danans too had suffered, but on his voyage home missed Cyrus and, wandering with his crew, came to Ephra. In Molossia for a short time he was king, an honor his family has enjoyed for all time since, but then he departed for the god, bringing him wealth from the finest of the spoils of Troy, and there in a quarrel over sacrificial meat a man whom he met stabbed him with a knife. His kindly Delphian hosts were greatly troubled, but he had paid his debt to destiny, for it was fated that one of the royal Eacids should abide forever within the ancient grove next to the well-built temple of the god and should live as a ritual overseer of the processions which honor heroes with numerous sacrifices. To establish his just fame, three words will suffice, it is no lying witness, Aegina, that authenticates the deeds of your and Zeus offspring. I feel the confidence to speak of a sovereign road of words, reaching from your home, that honors your splendid achievements. But respite is sweet in all undertakings, and even honey in Aphrodite's flowers of pleasure can cause satiety. Each one of us differs by nature in the life that is allotted him, one man has this gift, and another that, and it is impossible for one person successfully to attain complete happiness. I cannot speak of anyone to whom destiny has offered this as a secure and lasting gift. To you, Thierian, she has given a fair share of prosperity, you have acquired the boldness to do fine deeds, and she does not harm your mind's intelligence. I am your guest friend, avoiding covert censure, I will honor the man who is my friend with genuine praise, as if I were channeling water towards him, for this is the fitting reward for good men. No man of Achaea living above the Ionian Sea will approach me and take me to task. I trust in my friend's hospitality, and among his townsmen my gaze is serene, since I do not exaggerate and I thrust all violence from the path before my feet. May the rest of my life steal up on me in kindliness, any man of understanding will speak up if I come here singing crooked lies out of tune. So genes of the clan of the Euxenity. I swear I have not overstepped the mark in launching my tongue swiftly like a bronze-cheeked javelin which exempts the strong neck from the sweat of the wrestling bout, before the body is exposed to the blazing sun. If there was toil, greater is the joy that follows it. Let me be, if I was carried away and protested noisily, I am not too uncouth to pay a victor his due. Weaving crowns is an easy task, so strike up the prelude. To be sure, the muse binds gold and white ivory together with the lily-like flower she steals from under the dew of the sea. Sing of Zeus, and rouse the far-famed voice of hymns in honor of Nemea, but softly, it is fitting for us to speak with a gentle voice of the king of gods in this place, where men say he planted Aeacus and the mother who took his seed, to be a ruler in my famous land, and Heracles, to be for you a kindly guest friend and brother. If a man takes delight in others' company, I would say that a neighbor who loves him with steadfast intent is a joy beyond all others. And if this holds true for a god as well, so genes might with your help, subduer of giants, expect to live with good fortune, in tender duty to his father, on the well-built sacred street of his ancestors. For on both sides as he goes his house lies between your precincts, as if they were the yokes of four-horse chariots.
O blessed one, it is right for you to win over Hera's husband and his grey-eyed daughter, for you can often give mortals courage in the face of difficulties that are hard to surmount. May you furnish him with a life of enduring strength, and weave happiness into his youth to the end of shining old age, and may his children's children ever enjoy this present honor, and even greater in time to come. Never will my heart say that it has carpeted at Neoptolemus in unforgiving words, but to turn over the same ground three or four times leads nowhere, just like one barking at children, Corinth belongs to Zeus. Nemean 8. For Deinia's of Aegina, winner of the long sprint race Lady Ora, herald of Aphrodite's ambrosial tenderness, who sits on the eyelids of young girls and boys, you raise them up with the hands of necessity, gentle for one, rough for another. In every undertaking it is most desirable not to stray beyond just measure, and to be able to secure loves of the nobler kind, such as those, shepherds of the gifts of the Cyprian, which attended the bed of Zeus and Aegina. From here a son was born, king of Enoni, supreme in action and counsel. Many men many times begged to visit him, for the flower of heroes from neighboring lands were ready and willing, unsummoned, to obey his rule, both those who mustered their army in rocky Athens and the descendants of Pelops in Sparta. A suppliant, I clasp Iacus' holy knees, and on his dear city's behalf, and these his citizens I bring a Lydian headband patterned with resonant music, a Nemean decoration for the double stadion victories of Deinias and of his father Megas. In truth, if happiness is implanted by the gods it endures longer among men, such as that which freighted Cynaeras with wealth once in sea-girdled Cyprus. Look, I stand here on poised feet, catching my breath before I speak. Many tales have been told, in many ways, but to invent something new and test it on the touchstone, that is absolute danger. To the envious, words are a tasty morsel, and envy clutches at the noble, but picks no fight with inferior men. This it was that glutted itself on Telamon's son, making him fall hunched upon his sword, indeed, many men of no eloquence, but brave in heart have been pinned down by oblivion, because of a harsh quarrel, while the greatest glory is tendered to the slippery lie. In a secret ballot the Danans favored Odysseus and Ajax, denied the golden armor, wrestled with a bloody death. Truly, the wounds were unequal which both had hacked in their foe's warm flesh, as they toiled under cover of the protecting spear, both over newly slain Achilles, and in other labors of death-dealing days. Hateful slander indeed existed long ago as well, accomplice of fawning tales, a cunning schemer, mischief-working infamy, which crushes brilliance but for obscure men raises up a festering glory. Never may this temperament be mine, Father Zeus, but may I follow simple paths of life, so that after my death I do not taint my children with ill repute. Some men's prayers are for gold, others for limitless lands, but mine are to please my fellow citizens, and then to cover my limbs in earth, having praised the praiseworthy and scattered reproof on the wicked. Excellence soars upward like a tree fed on fresh dews, lifted among the wise, and just towards the liquid upper air. The need for friends comes in many forms, it is most valued in times of trouble, but joy too craves to look upon trusty support. Omegas, I cannot bring your life back again, that is the futile desire of empty hopes, but to set up a muse's stone for your homeland and for the Coriotee, to celebrate your twice-famous feat, is an easy task. I am glad to have broadcast a boast that fits your deeds, for many a man has charmed the pain from toil by chanting songs. Certainly the victory him existed long ago, even before strife arose between Adrastus and the Cadmines. Nemean 9. For Chromius of Etna, winner of the chariot race let us go in revel company, muses, from Apollo's temple at Sicyon to newly founded Etna, to Chromius' prosperous house, where the wide-flung doors are overrun by guests. Come, fashion a sweet hymn of verses, for he mounts his chariot of conquering horses, and calls for an invocation to the mother and her twin children, who share the watch over sheer Pytho. There is a saying among men, that a noble accomplishment should not be hidden on the ground in silence, what is needed is a divine song of heroic verse. Let us then lift high the deep-voiced lyre and lift up the pipe, for this very pinnacle of horse races, founded by Adrastus for Phoebus by the waters of Asipus. Mindful of this, I shall celebrate the hero with honors that bring him renown. He was king there at that time, and made his city great, glorifying it with new festivals and trials of men's strength and races with polished chariots.
Long before, he had fled bold plotting Amphiaros and dreadful civil strife in his ancestral home in Argos, for Talos' sons, forced out by faction, were no longer rulers there. But the stronger man may bring past conflict to an end. They gave the son of Echols manslaying Eraphile to be his wife. As a pledge of trust, and he became the greatest of the fair-haired Danans, and in later time led an army of men to seven-gated Thebes on a road that held no auspicious omens, Cronus' son had shaken his lightning and exhorted them not to set out from home with crazed intent, but to abandon their expedition. So the company, with bronze weapons and caparisoned horses, pressed eagerly on, marching to certain ruin. On the banks of Ismenus they rejected a sweet return home, fattening with their bodies the flowers of white smoke. Seven pyres fed on the men's young limbs, but for Amphiaros Zeus with his all-powerful thunderbolt split the earth's deep breast and buried him, horses and all, before Periclymenus' spear could strike him in the back, so bringing shame to the spirit of a fighting man, for in God sent panic even the sons of gods may flee. If it can be done, son of Cronus, I would hope to postpone for as long as possible this proud trial of life and death with the Phoenician army spears, and I entreat you, Father Zeus, to grant the children of Etna's men a long and well-governed destiny and to gather their people together in public festivals. For, as you know, they are lovers of horses there, and men who keep their minds above possessions. My words are difficult to believe, for love of gain covertly steals away that sense of shame which brings renown. But had you served as Chromius' shield-bearer in the midst of foot soldiers and horsemen's shouts, or in battles at sea, you would have judged, among the hazards of the shrill war cry, that in the conflict that goddess was moving his warrior's spirit to beat back the havoc of Anelius. Few men can counsel how to turn with hand and spirit the cloud of impending slaughter back onto their enemy's ranks. It is said that Hector's glory burst into flower beside Scamander's stream, but beside the steep rocky banks of Hellerus, at the place which men call Aria's crossing, this same brightness shone on Hagasidima's son in his early prime. On other days I shall speak of his many feats, some on the dusty land and others on the neighboring sea. After labors justly born in youth life moves gently toward old age. He should know that the gods have allotted him amazing happiness, for if as well as his many riches a man earns the glory of fame, there is no further mountain peak on which he may set his feet. The symposium is the friend of peace, but newly won victory also blossoms when attended by gentle song, and the voice grows in confidence next to the mixing bowl. Let someone stir it, the sweet inspirer of revelry, and hand round the vine's potent child in the silver bowls which his Mares once won for Chromius and sent to him from holy Sicyon with ritually woven garlands of Leto's son. Father Zeus, I pray that with the grace's help I may proclaim that success, and may outdo many men in honoring his victory in my song, throwing my javelin closest to the muse's mark. Nemean 10 for Theus of Argos, winner in the wrestling sing, graces, of the city of Danaeus, and his fifty daughters on their bright thrones, Argos, Hera's home, fit for a goddess. Its bold deeds cause it to blaze with countless exploits. To tell of Perseus' encounter with the Gorgon Medusa would take too long, and many are the towns it founded in Egypt as a result of the labors of Epiphus, nor did Hypermestra wander from the path, she who kept her one dissension sword in its sheath. Diomedes long ago was made an immortal god by the fair-haired goddess of the grey eyes, and at Thebes the earth, smashed by Zeus' thunderbolts, received and hid that storm cloud of war, the prophet son of Echols. From ancient times Argos has excelled in its beautiful-haired women, a reputation clearly proved by Zeus' advances to Alcmene and Danae. In Adrastus' father and in Lynceus it blended the fruit of intellect with straight-dealing justice. It nurtured the spearman Amphitryon, who in matchless good fortune entered kinship with that god, when in his bronze armor he killed the Teleboi, for. Assuming his appearance, the king of the immortals entered his hall, carrying in him the fearless seed of Heracles, whose wife Hebe, most beautiful of goddesses, paces Olympus beside her mother, presider over marriage. My mouth is too small to tell of everything Argo's precinct holds as its share of noble deeds, and men's satiety is hard to meet. Even so, rouse the well-strung lyre and turn the mind to wrestling, since the competition for bronze urges the people to go to Hera's ox sacrifice and the judgment of the games, where Oleus' son Theus was twice a victor and found forgetfulness of the toils he so lightly endured. 
At Pytho II he once overcame a multitude of Hellenes and, traveling with good fortune, won crowns at Nemea and the Isthmus. He gave the Muses employment for their plow, by winning three times at the gates to the sea and three times on sacred ground established by Adrastus. Father Zeus, his mouth is silent about his heart's true desires, for the fulfillment of all endeavors lies with you, but when he prays for your favor he offers daring and a heart not unfamiliar with labor. I sing of matters known to the god, and to all who struggle to reach the peaks of the paramount games. Pisa mounts the highest event, instituted by Heracles, but by way of a prelude, sweet Athenian voices have twice sung this man's praises at their rites, and to Hera's gallant people came the fruit of the olive in richly patterned jars, earth baked by fire. Theus, many times has honor from victory in the games come to the famous family of your mother's forebears, through the favor of the graces and of the sons of Tyndareus. If I were a kinsman of Thrasyclus or Antaeus I would not think it right to hide the light of my eyes in Argos. How many times has this horse-rearing city of Proetus flourished because of victories in the valleys of Corinth? For times they came away rewarded by the men of Cleone, and from Sicyon laden with silver wine bowls, and from Pelana with soft woolen cloaks on their backs. As for reckoning up their countless prizes of bronze, it is impossible, for I have too little time to calculate them, prizes which Cleter, Tegea, and the towering cities of Achaea and Lycaean offered beside the racecourse of Zeus, to be one with the strength of hands and feet. It is no wonder that they are natural athletes, for Castor and his brother Polydices came to Pamphy's house, and were entertained, they who keep watch over spacious Sparta, and share with Hermes and Heracles the direction of successful games. Deep is their regard for men of justice, the race of gods is indeed faithful. Changing places turn by turn, they spend one day with their dear father Zeus, and the next in earth's hidden places in the hollows of Therapne, fulfilling an equal destiny. For when Castor died in battle Polydices chose this life in preference to a holy divine existence in heaven. Idas, for some reason angered over cattle, had wounded Castor with the point of his bronze spear, watching intently from Theogetus Lincius, who of all men had the keenest sight, had seen them sitting in an oak's hollow trunk. On swift feet the sons of Apharius at once ran up and quickly plotted a prodigious deed, and suffered terribly for it at the hands of Zeus, for Leda's son arrived in hot pursuit, while they stood their ground next to their father's tomb, from which they had wrenched Hades' marker of polished stone and hurled it at Polydus's chest, but they could not crush him or force him backwards. He leapt on them with his swift spear and thrust the bronze into Lincius' side. Zeus flung at Idas a smoking fiery thunderbolt, and they burnt together, all alone. To encounter those who are stronger is a harsh struggle for men. Quickly Tyndareus' son turned back to his mighty brother, and found him not yet dead, but shivering and gasping for breath. Shedding hot tears, he groaned and cried aloud, Father, son of Cronus, what deliverance will there be from grief? Pass sentence of death on me as well as on him, Lord. Honor vanishes when a man's friends are taken away, and in times of suffering few mortals can be trusted to share his burden. So he spoke, and Zeus stood before him and uttered these words, You are my son, as for this man, your mother's hero husband came to her after me and dropped his mortal seed in her. But come, despite this I will grant you a choice, you may wish to escape death and repellent old age, and live with me on your own on Olympus, together with Athene and Ares of the Black Spear, and that will be your allotted destiny, or, if you are your brother's champion, and are minded to share everything equally with him, you may live half your life under the earth and half in the golden palaces of heaven. So he spoke, and Polydices chose no wavering purpose in his heart, but released first the eye, and then the voice of bronze belted Castor. Nemi in 11. For Aristagoras of Tenedos, on being installed as a counselor Hestia, daughter of Rhea, by your allotted office patron of council chambers, sister of Zeus on high and Hera who shares his throne, graciously welcome Aristagoras into your hall next to your shining scepter, and his companions who honor you and keep Tenedos on an upright course, venerating you as first among gods often with libations and often with the savor of sacrifice. For them the lyre and song fill the air, and in their perpetual feasts the dictates of Zeus' protector of strangers are duly observed. Grant that he completes his twelve-month term with distinction and with his heart unscarred. I count his father Arce Silas to be blessed in his physique that excites admiration and in his natural intrepidity. 
If a man is rich and surpasses others in beauty and has given proof of his strength by victory in the games, let him remember that his limbs' clothing is mortal and earth is the very last garment he will put on. Yet he is justifiably praised in his citizens' generous words, and we must fashion praise for him in honey-echoing songs. Sixteen brilliant victories have crowned Aristagoras and his illustrious family, won at regional games in wrestling and the Pancration, source of great pride. His parents' diffident anxiety held their strong son back from competing in the contests at Pytho and Olympia. Truly I swear that in my judgment if he had gone to Castalia and Cronus' well-wooded hill he would have returned from the four-year festival laid down by Heracles more honored than his adversaries, reveling in his victory, his hair bound in bright crowns. But empty-headed boasting hurls one mortal down from success, and another, too little confident in his strength, whose timid spirit drags him back by the hand, falls short of the glory he deserves. It was indeed easy to deduce that his bloodline comes from Sparta, from Pisandrus long ago, who came with Orestes from Amyclae, leading a bronze-armored army of Aeolians to this place. It is mingled with that of Melanippus, his mother's forebear, who came from the waters of Ismenus. Ancient qualities display their strength in alternate generations of men, the dark plowed earth does not yield a constant harvest, nor, as the years will round, is it the rule for trees to bear fragrant blossom of equal richness, but they come and go. Just so destiny governs the mortal race, no clear signal comes to mankind from Zeus. For all that, we set sail with great ambitions in our desire to do numerous deeds, for our limbs are shackled by shameless hope, and the streams of prescience lie far away. In matters of gain, one should hunt out due measure, the madness of inaccessible desires is too sharp to bear. Isthmians Isthmian 1. For Herodotus of Thebes, winner of the chariot race mother, Phoebe of the golden shield, I shall judge your demands even above my want of leisure. Let not rocky Delos, whose concerns now absorb me, be angry with me, for what is dearer to good men than cherished parents? Give way, island of Apollo. With the gods' help I shall complete both offerings of song together, and celebrate in the dance both Phoebus of the unshorn hair on sea-washed CEOs, with its seafaring men, and also the sea-bounded ridge of the Isthmus, since it has conferred on Cadmus' people six crowns from the games, the honor of glorious victories for their country, a land where also Alcmene bore her fearless son, before whom the dogs of Gerion once flinched in fear. But it is for Herodotus that I fashion a gift of honor, for his four-horse chariot, and for his handling of its reins with his own hands, and I wish to associate him with a hymn to Castor or to Iolas. For they were born to be the mightiest of hero charioteers in Lacedaemon and in Thebes, and in the games they put their hands to the greatest number of contests, and graced their houses with tripods, cauldrons, and golden bowls. Whenever they tasted the crowns of victory, their excellence shines out with brightness in both naked races, and in the contests where armed men run, their shields clattering, and also when they threw javelins from their hands, and when they flung discuses of stone, for the pentathlon did not exist, but a prize was given for each event. Often they bound their hair with close-knit garlands from these games, and appeared in glory beside Durst's waters and by the Eurotas, one of them Ithacal's son, of the same race as the Sone men, the other Tyndareus son, who lived among the Achaeans in his house on the high plateau of Therapon. Farewell to you, but as I wrap my robe of song about Poseidon and the sacred Isthmus, and on Chesta's shores, I shall as I honor this man speak of the glorious fate of his father Asopodorus and his ancestral lands in Orchomenus, which have welcomed him back from a boundless sea, when he was oppressed by shipwreck and chill calamity. But now his family's destiny has again established him in the fair weather of former times. The man who has toiled with understanding also wins foresight, and if he dedicates his whole heart to excellence, employing both expense and effort, we must with an ungrudging spirit grant him a proud boast if he achieves it. For it is a trifling offering if a skilled poet, speaking a good word to mark many great labors, erects a splendid memorial in which all may share. Different rewards bring pleasure to men for different deeds, the shepherd, the plowman, the bird trapper, the man whose livelihood is in the sea for all men strain to keep persistent hunger from their bellies. But the greatest profit is earned by the man who wins splendid glory in war or in the games, through praise, which is the choicest address from the tongues of citizens and strangers.
As for us, we must sing of our neighbor, Cronus son the earth shaker, lord of the running horses, to repay his aid in the chariot race, and we must call upon your sons, Amphitryon. And the vale of Minyas, and Demeter's famous grove at Eleusis, and Eubea's twisting racecourse. To these, Protesilus, I add your precinct at Phylas of the men of Achaea. But to give a full account of the successes which Hermes, god of the games, has granted Herodotus is precluded by the brief measure of my song. In truth, what is passed over in silence often brings greater happiness. May he, lifted up on the tuneful Pyrian's bright wings, still yet wreathe his hand with prized garlands from Pytho and from the Alpheus at Olympia, bringing honor to seven-gated Thebes. If a man keeps his wealth hidden indoors, laughing scornfully at others, he does not realize that he will render up his soul to Hades unattended by fame. Ismian II. For Xenocrates of Acragas, winner of the chariot race when, Thrasybulus, poets of former times took the splendid lyre and mounted the chariot of the golden circlet muses, they would lightly shoot their honey-voiced love songs at any boy whose alluring late summer beauty could woo fair-throned Aphrodite. For the muse was not yet greedy for gain, nor worked for hire, nor did sweet soft-voiced songs with silvered faces offer themselves for sale, peddled by honey-voiced terpsichore. But today she orders us to bear in mind the Argive saying, which comes very close to the truth, money it is, money that makes the man, said the man deserted by both possessions and friends. No more of that, for you are wise, and not unknown to you is the Isthmian chariot victory of which I sing, which Poseidon awarded Xenocrates, and sent him a crown of Dorian wild celery to wreathe in his hair, honoring an expert charioteer, a splendor for the men of Acragas. Mighty Apollo saw him at Crisa, and also gave him glory there, and in shining Athens, reveling in the famed favor of the Erechtheity, he found no fault with the chariot-protecting hand with which Nicomachus, whipper of horses, precisely handled all his reins, whom also the heralds of the seasons announced, the Aleans, truceholders of Zeus the son of Cronus, who doubtless had enjoyed some active guest friendship. They welcomed him with sweet breathing voices when he fell on golden victory's knees in their country which men call the grove of Olympian Zeus, where the sons of Enesidemus enjoyed immortal honors, for indeed your house, Thrasybulus, is not unacquainted with pleasing victory revels or with honeyed songs of pride. For no hill lies in the way, nor is the road steep when one brings the honors of the Heliconian goddesses to the houses of distinguished men. I have thrown the disc as far, may I now cast my javelin as far as Xenocrates outstripped other men in the sweetness of his disposition. Respected in the company of his fellow townsmen, he observed the Panhellenic code in his horse-rearing practice, and welcomed every feast of the gods with open arms. No wind's contrary blast forced him to furl the sails at his hospitable table, in summer he would go as far as Phasis, and in winter to the shore of the Nile. Envious expectations hang around mortals' minds. Do not then allow this man to be silent about his father's virtues, nor about these hymns, for certainly I did not shape them to stand still. Make these words known to him, Nicosippus, when you encounter my estimable guest friend. Ismian III. For Melissus of Thebes, winner of the chariot race if a man is successful either in far-famed games or in the power of wealth, and stifles restless excess in his heart, he deserves to enjoy his fellow townsmen's praise. Zeus, from you come great accomplishments to mortals, their happiness lives longer when they are righteous, but does not equally prosper for all time when it keeps company with crooked minds. To reward a good man's illustrious deeds we must both sing hymns for him and, as he revels in victory, raise him up with the gentle charm of poetry. Melissa's good fortune has brought him a second prize which may incline his heart toward pleasurable rejoicing. He won one crown in the dales of Isthmus, and then in the low-lying valley of the deep-chested lion, he caused Thebe to be proclaimed by his chariot victory. He does not disgrace the inborn excellence of his family. You here must surely know the ancient fame of Cleonymus and his chariots, and on their mother's side these men shared in the wealth of Labdicus' clan and trod the strenuous path of four-horse chariot racing. Life, as the days roll past, changes now in this way and now in that, and only the sons of the gods steer clear of wounds. Isthmian for Melissus of Thebes, winner in the Pancration by the gods' favor, Melissus, there are myriad paths leading everywhere, which I can follow to him your family's successes, since you have revealed a full store of them to me at the Isthmus.
Through these the Cleonomids continually flourish, with a god's help, as they live their mortal lives through to their end. Different winds blow hard on all mankind at different times, driving them on. But these men have been honored in Thebes since its beginning, it is said, as friendly hosts, to its surrounding peoples, for they lack strident arrogance, and as for the testimonials of boundless fame that are blown by winds among men, living and dead, these they have attained in entirety, and by their outstanding manly deeds have from their home touched the pillars of Heracles. Do not any longer strive for farther flung success. They were horse rearers and gained the approval of brazen Ares, but for all that, on one day a cruel snowstorm of war robbed their hallowed hearth of four men. Yet now in its turn, after the darkness of winter's months, it is as if the variegated earth has by the gods' design flowered with red roses. He who makes the earth tremble, whose seat is on Chestus and the sea bridge before Corinth's walls, by awarding this wonderful hymn to the family rouses the ancient glory of famous deeds from its bed. It had fallen asleep, but is now awakened, and its skin shines out like the morning star, brilliant to look upon among the other stars. This ancient fame proclaimed their chariots victory both on Athens' slopes, and in Adrastus' games at Sicyon, and awarded them leaves of song such as these from poets of that time. Nor did they withhold their curved chariot from national festivals, but gladly laid out expenditure on horses, in competition with all the Hellenes. Those who take no part endure the silence of anonymity, but even those who do compete are invisible to fortune until they attain the final goal. For she hands out to men a share of both good and bad, and lesser men's cunning can overtake their betters and make them stumble. You must know of the courage of Ajax, which in the dead of night he cut through and bloodied with his sword, and brought reproach to the sons of the Hellenes who went to Troy. But Homer, we know, has honored him among men, in that he has set straight his whole achievement and made it known with his staff of wonderful verses for later men to use as themes in song. For if a man says something well it spreads abroad as an immortal utterance, and the ever unquenched brilliance of noble deeds ranges over the fruitful earth and the sea. May we find the muses in sympathetic mood, and so kindle such a beacon of hymns also for Melissus, scion of Telesiades, a crown worthy of a Pancratiast, for in the fight his courage resembles the daring of loud roaring mountain lions, and in cunning he is like the fox, which spreads itself backwards to block the eagle's onrush. One must use every stratagem to weaken one's opponent's strength, for he was not granted the physique of an Orion, yet though he is of puny appearance his strength makes him a hard man to overcome. Indeed, a man short in stature, but of unyielding spirit once went from Cadmine Thebes to the house of Antaeus in wheat-bearing Libya, to wrestle with him and stop him roofing Poseidon's temple with strangers' skulls. This was Alcmene's son, who after he had ranged over the surface of the entire earth and the grey sea's steep cliff bowl, and cleared its passage for sailors, went to Olympus, where now he lives next to the Aegis-bearer. Enjoying supreme happiness and is honored as the god's friend, Married to Hebe, he is lord of a golden palace and son-in-law to Hera. For him we citizens prepare a feast beyond the Electran gates, and a newly built circle of altars, heaping up burnt offerings in honor of the bronze-armored eight who died, the sons born to him by Megara, daughter of Creon. For them at sunset a flame leaps up and burns all night, kicking the heavens with its savory smoke. On the second day is the conclusion of the yearly games, the work of strength. Here this man, his hair whitened with myrtle, displayed a double victory, and a third before this as a boy, obedient to the copious advice of his or guiding helmsman. I shall join Orsias with him in my revel song, showering them with this hymn's delight. Ismian 4. For Phylacidas of Aegina, winner in the Pancration many titled Thea, mother of the sun, because of you all men reckon gold to be powerful beyond other things. So also it is through the honor you give them, O queen, that ships which battle on the sea or horses harnessed to chariots arouse admiration in swiftly wheeling contests. And in athletic competitions too a man wins longed for glory when many crowns have bound his hair for victories gained by hands or swiftness of feet. But men's prowess is decided by the gods, truly, two things only shepherd life to its sweetest perfection, if a man is blessed with flourishing prosperity, and if he enjoys a noble reputation. Do not seek to become Zeus, if a share of these blessings comes to you, you possess everything. Mortal ways suit mortal men. 
For you, Philacetus, the flower of double success is recorded at the Isthmus and at Nemea, both for you and for Pythias, in the Pancration. But my heart can taste no hymns if I omit the Eacids. I have come with the graces to this well ordered city for the sake of Lampon's sons. Once a man sets his foot on the clear path of God given achievements, do not hold back from blending apt boasts into your song in recognition of former labors. For among heroes, two noble fighters have merited praise, and they have been celebrated for countless ages on the lyre and on the many voiced music of pipes. By Zeus' ordinance, reverence for them has given skilled poets their theme. In the Aetolians' bright sacrifices, Aeneas' mighty sons are honored, and at Thebes' Iolas the charioteer, Perseus at Argos, and the spearfighters Castor and Polydus's by Eurotas' streams. But in Enone it is the great-hearted spirit of Aeacus and his sons, who twice in battle sacked the city of Troy, first in Heracles' expedition and later with the sons of Atreus. Now, lift my gaze up from the plain. Tell me, who were sickness killers, and who hectors? Memnon's too, the Ethiopian's fearless bronze-armored chieftain? Who wounded noble Telephus with his spear by Caicus banks? My mouth proclaims Aegina, famous island, as their fatherland, from ancient times it has stood, built as a tower for men to scale by means of lofty exploits. My tongue, ready with words, has many arrows to sound out in their praise, and in the recent war Ajax city Salamis could testify to being saved by its sailors in Zeus' lethal rainstorm, a fall of bloody hail on numberless men. But stop, drench that boast in silence. It is Zeus who deals out good and bad, Zeus the master of all. Honors such as these also delight in victory's joy, accompanied by the honeyed pleasure of song. Let him who struggles to perform in the games learn well about the family of Cleonicus, their men's long toil is not lost in obscurity, nor has great expenditure worn down their fervent hopes. I praise Pythias too among body tamers for setting Philacetus blows on a straight course, skillful with his hands, and a match for him in judgment. Take up a crown for him, bring him a headband of fine wool, and with them send forth this new winged him. Ismian 5. For Philacetus of Aegina, winner in the boys' pancration as men do at the height of a symposium, so we mix a second bowl of the Muses' songs for Lampon's family of outstanding athletes. They first won the finest of crowns at Nemea, Zeus, through your favor, and now again with the aid of the Isthmus master and the fifty Nereids Philacetus, his youngest son, has been victorious. May we have a third libation to offer the Olympian savior, to be poured with honey-voiced songs over Aegina. For if a man takes delight in toil and expenditure, and so succeeds in God-framed exploits, and if a divine power plants in him the pleasure of fame, he drops his anchor at the furthest limits of happiness, honored by the gods. With feelings such as these Cleonicus' son prays to encounter Hades and to accept gray old age, I appeal to Clotho on her high throne and her sister fates to agree with the noble commands of my friend. As for you, golden chariot descendants of Aeacus, I proclaim that my clearest charge as I come to your island is to rain down praises upon it. Numberless paths, 100 feet wide, have been laid out by your illustrious deeds, one after the other, beyond the source of the Nile and further than the Hyperboreans, and there is no city so barbarous or of such crude speech that it has not heard of the fame of the hero Peleus, blessed son-in-law of the gods, or of Ajax Telamon's son, or of his father who, an eager ally, was taken in ships with the men of Tyrans to bronze-loving war at Troy, a hero's struggle by Alcmene's son. Because of Laomedon's crimes. He stormed Pergamus and with Telamon slew the people of the Meropes and the oxherd Alcyonius, huge as a mountain, when he met him at Phlegry, nor did he, Heracles, keep his hands from his deep-voiced boastering. But when he came to summon Aeacus' son to the expedition he found them feasting. As Amphitryon's son, the mighty spearman, stood there in his lion's pelt, incomparable Telamon held out to him a wine cup encrusted with gold and invited him to pour the first nectar libation. Heracles raised his unconquerable hands to the heaven and spoke, Father Zeus, if ever you heard my prayers with a willing heart now, now, I entreat you to bring to birth from Arabia a daring son for this man to be my destined guest friend. Make his body as indestructible as this hide which now enfolds me, taken from the beast which long ago I killed in Nemea as the very first of my labors, and may his courage be equal to it. 
He spoke, and the gods sent a great eagle, the lord of birds, and the thrill of sweet joy entered him. Then like a prophet he declared, Telamon, you shall have the son you ask for. Following the portent of this bird, call him Ajax the powerful, awesome among men in the struggles of Enelius. So he spoke, and quickly sat down. To rehearse all their exploits would be too long a task, since I have come, Muse, to marshal the revels for Philacidas, and for Pythias and Euthamines, and so, in the Argive manner, my tale will be very brief. At the Isthmus they won three victories in the Pancration, and others at Leafy Nemia, these brilliant boys, and their uncle. What imps have they brought to light, to be their allotted portion? They refresh the Seliciad line with the grace's finest dew, and inhabiting this god-loved city they have exalted the house of Themistius. Lampon, showing zeal in his task, truly honors Hesiod's maxim and quotes it with approval to his sons, he embellishes his city for the benefit of all, and is esteemed for his hospitality to strangers, he strives for due measure in judgment and holds fast to it. Nor does his tongue leave his thoughts behind, you would say that this man in the company of athletes is a Nashian whetstone among other stones, a tamer of bronze. To them I shall give to drink the holy water of Durs, which the deep-girdled daughters of Nemosyne have caused to gush out near Cadmus' well-walled gates. Is me and six. For Strepsiades of Thebes, winner in the Pancration in which of your land's past glories, blessed Thebe, does your heart take a special pleasure? Was it your exaltation of Dionysus, with his loose-flowing hair, to be an associate of Demeter of the clanging bronze? Or was it when you received the mightiest of the gods at midnight in a snowstorm of gold, at the time when he stood in the doorway of Amphitryon, in pursuit of his wife for the birth of Heracles? Or was it because of Tiresias and his subtle counsels? Or was it because of Iolas, skilled handler of horses? Or was it the sown men, with their unfaltering spears? Or was it when you drove Adrastus, stripped of his myriad companions, back from the violent shouts of battle to Argo's land of horses? Or when you founded the Dorian colony of Lacedaemon on a firm footing, and when your descendants the Aegeidae took Amicle in obedience to the Pythian oracles? But no more of that. The ancient brilliant sleeps, and mortals are unaware of all that does not reach poetry's finest flower, yoked to splendid streams of verse. Therefore make revel for Strepsiades too with sweet-voiced hymns, for he is victorious in the Pancration at the Isthmus, of amazing strength and handsome to look upon, he wins a distinction which does not shame his beauty. He is bathed in the brightness of the violet-haired muses, and he has given a share in his crown to his namesake uncle, whom Ares of the bronze shield conveyed to his doom. But for brave men honor is stored up as their reward. Let all know clearly, who in a cloud of battle such as this defend their beloved land from the hail of blood, keeping destruction at bay in the face of the enemy, that they raise their fellow townsmen's fame to the highest degree, both in their lives and after they are dead. Just so you, son of Diotidas, followed the example of the warrior Meleager, and of Hector and Amphiaros, breathing out the full bloom of your life as you fought in the forefront of the tumult. Where the bravest bore the brunt of battle strife at the limit of their hopes. The grief I suffered was too great for words, but now the earth holder has granted me calm after the storm, and I shall sing, binding garlands in my hair. May the immortal's envy not bring about disorder, because I pursue the pleasure of the day, and walk quietly towards old age, and my fated span of life. For we all alike die, but our destinies are not the same. If a man gazes on faraway things he is nevertheless too weak to reach the bronze-floored house of the gods. Indeed, when Bellerophon desired to enter heaven's stables to join the company of Zeus, winged Pegasus threw his master off, a most bitter end awaits the sweetness of unlawful joys. Even so, Loxia is exulting in your luxuriant golden hair, may you yet bestow on us a fine flowering crown in your games at Pytho. Ismian 7. For Cleandrus of Aegina, winner in the Pancration on behalf of Cleandrus and his youthful prime, O young men, let someone go to the bright portal of his father Telesarchus and wake the revel that is glorious recompense for his toil, both for his victory at the Isthmus and because at Nemea he gained ascendancy in the contest. So I too, though my heart grieves, am invited to invoke the golden muse. We have been delivered from great distress, but we must not let ourselves be denied crowns, nor should you nurse your anxieties. 
No, now that we are relieved of our intractable troubles let us also after labors sing a sweet civic song, since Tantalus stone, an intolerable labor for Hellas, has been shifted by some god from above our heads. But fear arising from past events holds back my strong ambition, it is best to keep one's eyes always on each thing before one's feet, for over men hangs a deceptive existence, as it unwinds life's path. Yet even for this mortals may find a cure, if only they have freedom, men must keep good hope in mind, and one raised in seven-gated Thebes should hold out the flower of the graces to Aegina. For these twins were the youngest daughters of Asipus, and they found favor with Zeus the king. One he settled by Durst's beautiful waters as ruler of a chariot-loving city, while you he conducted to Enopia's island and lay with you, and there you gave birth to glorious Aeacus, dearest of mortals to his deep thundering father, who settled disputes even for the immortals. His godlike sons and their sons, lovers of battle, were counted the bravest in the exercise of the groaning tumult of brazen war. Yet they were temperate and prudent in heart. This also the assembled gods remembered, when Zeus and glorious Poseidon wrangled over marriage to Thetis, each wishing her to be his beautiful wife, for desire had taken hold of them. But the gods' immortal wits did not deliver her to their bed, since they were obedient to the decree of fate, for wise Themis said in their assembly that it was ordained that the sea goddess would bear a princely son, mightier than his father, whose hand would hurl a weapon greater than thunderbolt or invincible trident. If she was to couple with Zeus or with his brothers. Come, you must put an end to this. Let her enjoy a mortal's bed, and see her son die in battle, equal to Ares in his hand's strength, and to the lightning in the swiftness of his feet. This is my advice, give her in marriage as a godsend prize to Peleus son of Aeacus, who they say is the most god-fearing man to be raised on Iolcus plain. Let this message go at once straight to Chiron's everlasting cave, that Nereus' daughter must not once again place in our hands the voting leaves of dissension, but on some evening of the full moon let her, in submission to that hero, untie her virginity's lovely bridle. So spoke the goddess in counsel to the children of Cronus, and they nodded approval with their immortal brows. Nor did the fruit of her words wither away, they say that the king agreed with the rest to this marriage for Thetis, and poets' mouths have revealed to the ignorant Achilles' youthful exploits. How he bloodied Mishia's vineclad plain, drenching it in Telephus' dark gore, how he built a bridge for the Atreids' return and rescued Helen. How with his spear he sliced through the sinews of Troy, which before this had prevented him from ordering the work of manslaying battle on the plain, violent Memnon, proud Hector, and other chieftains. These Achilles showed the way to the house of Persephone, he the bulwark of the Aeacids, glorifying Aegina and his roots. Not even in death did songs desert him, the maidens of Helican stood by his pyre and tomb and poured over him a many-voiced dirge, and the gods too resolved that noble men should become a theme for the hymns of these goddesses, even after their death. And that rule still holds good today, as the chariot of the muses makes haste to sing a loud song for Nicocles, to remember his boxing. Honor him all of you, the man who in the valley of the Isthmus was awarded the crown of Dorian wild celery, for in time gone by he too overcame men who lived round about, beating them down with fists which none could escape. Nor is he shamed by the line of his father's excellent brother, therefore let one of his companions play a welcome crown of myrtle for Cleandrus in recognition of his pancration. Since in time past Alcathus games and Epidorus young men welcomed him with good fortune. The good man has reason to praise him, for he has not suppressed his youth in obscurity, being unacquainted with fine deeds. 